There goes the neighborhood. We got David Lefkowitz here. He's a Long Island arts guy. He's got his own radio show. Greetings from Long Island, where every highway is a sunrise. It's time for Dave's Gone By, an hour of comedy, talk, and music brought to you by Total Theater, with your host, Dave Lefkowitz. You've never heard anything like it, so sit back, relax, squeal if you must. Here's the host of Dave's Gone By, Dave! Tropical hot dog night! Like two flamingos in a fruit bite! Well, there goes the neighborhood. Welcome, welcome everyone on this Sunday, this very first Sunday in October, October 5th, for the 293rd episode of Dave's Gone By. We got a packed, jam-packed episode, like several that we've had for the past couple of weeks. Not one but two guests, which is going to be really cool, plus all sorts of stuff to talk about, plus I have a new song that I will be playing for you on this particular show, something that speaks to the heart of what we're all kind of going through as we watch the topsy-turvy tumblings of Wall Street. Speaking of topsy-turvy tumblings, I have in the studio back since last week. I don't even know where you were last week, but he's back in the studio, ladies and gentlemen. My... Fine and well, it's, they're bon vivant in there somewhere. I forget the the intro I'm supposed to do for you. And but you're Jeff Goodman. It, I'm a bon vivant all a man, all around of man about town. All around man about town, Jeff Goodman. Hello, Jeff. Hello, you're looking Dave. a little peaked. Are you just tired, or are you under the weather? I don't know. I'm under the I'm under the economy. Oh yeah. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You don't even have to explain any more than I that. Know. It's just been, you know. Although, the one and thing... it seems like you got a little grayer since I last saw you. <laughs> I'm under the economy, too, I'm dude. I'm telling you. Yeah. No, I, it's not that I've, I've grown my beard longer, yeah. so you see the gray more prominently. Mm-hmm. And probably a little less hair on the old head. Although, as you can see, my pubes are really filling out and, and bushy and black. No, I really can't see that. Oh, nor come, nor do I have the, the desire to. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, y- is it just that, or are you, you, you okay? There's I mean, a lot of stuff. Were you? Where were you last week? I was home. Oh, I thought you were like going off to for no. the new year with family somewhere or something I, like that. Well, that was... All right, well, you're going to talk about it. That's cool. We'll, we'll yak about it in the car on the way home. <laughs> or if we get really bored towards the end of the show, we'll, we'll right. dredge that it's, back up. Well, if we get a psychiatrist to call in, <laughs> maybe I'll go through therapy at that point. Yeah, that's yeah, I, You know what? I can do some, too. Let me tell you. It's been <laughs> tough times for everybody. But you know what? This is my favorite time. Just getting on here in front of the mic with a friend at the other mic and talking to the world. So who's the other guest? Radio. We have two guests. So, well, no, you're the guest co-host. No, but so we technically have three other people in the room. It's it's crowded. It's like an elevator already. <laughs> an elevator. No, this is this this is the coolest the show. Down one. <laughs> we're calling it Hofquis. 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 Because one of our guests is Carol Edmonston, whom you may not have heard of. Never heard of her. Not heard of her. But her uncle was the late Sid Hoff. Do you know who Sid Hoff is? Why do I know the name? I'm going to spell his first name. S Y D. I know. Watch what I'm doing with my hand. And it has nothing to do with my pubes. No. Oh, well, he was an illustrator, a cartoonist. He drew Danny and the Dinosaur, Sammy uh, the Seal, all these really uh, adorable, um, lumpy, bumpy sort of creatures. Nope. Oh, you, know, you remember Danny and the Dinosaur, I right? They're very cute. He had this great way of drawing people. He also did grown-up books that as well. Too, not in my generation. <laughs> it was in, well, yeah, it would have been. And mine, too. I didn't know those books. And, and he did all this. He, he did uh, Larry the Long, Long Dog, which was about Dachshunds, which I uh, guess. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. I didn't know these characters. Well, Sid Hoff, it, believe me, if there are parents out there who have children, you know who Sid Hoff was. And Carol Edmonston is his niece. Uh-huh. Uh, so she was going to come on for a little while and talk about her uncle and the interesting life that he led and the stuff that he was doing and some cool stories about him. Just kind of some kind of stuff about the late Sid Hoff okay. from his niece. And we're going to be talking to the executive editor of Backstage, 
Ooh. Can I get an ooh? ooh. ooh. David Sheward, who has also been on New York One. He, I, I think he's going to be on there. He's here to talk with me about the new Broadway revival of Equus, featuring Harry Potter and his magic wand, which is the joke that everybody's been saying, but because, of course, he's been naked in the show. Um, so we'll discuss that, among other elements of I this production. I didn't even look for his magic wand. Today. Did you see Equus? So of course I did. Oh, fantastic. So we're, we'll all uh, get into this whole dialogue. It'll be mm-hmm. a tree, trio-log, whatever. And if you've ever made a trio-log, you know just how hard those are to flush. But, you It'll know, be a, get the word, conversation. Ooh, yes. <laughs> so it's going to be me, you, David Seward, and, and, and all talking about it. You know what I'm waiting to have, though? What? A proversation. Proversation. Is that with a professional or with a hooker? Well, you know, if you have conversations. Oh. Shouldn't you have con- proversations? Or, or maybe it's all proverbs that you'd be talking Now, I wonder about. if that's already uh, Dave calling in. Which oh, would let's be, be a little early, but that's okay. Um... Well, it's the phone, Dave. Someone's why don't you do the? Why don't you do our sponsors, sponsors, our magical, wonderful sponsors? You know who they are. Well, let's see. There's always the Hewlett Minuteman Press. They are the copy kings of Broadway. They are located, I forget what street they're. They're ne- across the street from Lomans, and next to the Funk Lomans Shoe Store. And then, of course, there is the Bible of Broadway, Performing Arts Insider for 65 years. The Bible of Broadway. Tell but you no, no, it was only the it's only the Bible for the last sixty. <laughs> they did five years to get a tablet. That's right. The first fifteen years, they had to write out the tablets. They had to bring it down the mountain. Right. They had to show it to the people. People had to look at it and say, "Do we believe in this?" And then, then they go, "Ah, this is the <laughs> Bible." The Bible, yeah. So it is though for people in the entertainment industry, in TV, in radio, in newspapers, journalism. It's they a, use it's it. An excellent reference. Guide. See everything you need to know. On, off, off, off Broadway, cabaret, opera, and beyond in the pages, the hard copy pages of Performing Arts Insider. Is this stuff beyond cabaret and opera? Um, yes, there's awards and special events. Oh, okay. You know, things, uh, things like the Backstage Actor Fest, speaking of David Seward, or the Tony Awards. Those, that doesn't fit into any other uh, the New York category. Musical, uh, the, the, the theater, the new musical, the thing that's just there. The festival, no, that, that fits into off Broadway. Because that was but, okay, point. but you did put it in there. Oh, of course, it, everything goes in there. Everything in the pages of Performing Arts Insider Theater, unbelievable magazine. Go to performingartsinsider.com dot com for more information, and please go to Dave's Gone By dot org to find out how you can get a really, really, really great price if you subscribe. Now we have two other wonderful, wonderful sponsors. Who are they? One is Fancy Schmancy Balloons. Please explain. Where you can. Get all, for all your balloon needs. I, I sound like my wife's been watching these old Charlie Chan movies. I sound like, explain, please. Okay. What Mr. is Ch- Mr. Balloon? Chan. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, tell if, me about the balloons. If you have party and you want pity, pity, I made party last night. Still won't flush. <laughs> That's my second toilet joke. Okay, yeah. So continue. Continue, what was your first please. Joke? Oh, something about flushing. So try conversation something. Anyway, continue. Oh, notice that we're both. They were like that big, and oops, there they go. Brain small for mouth so large. Please continue. <laughs> and, and well, if, if you have party, you want pretty, pretty decorations, you call 516-797-3229. That's 516-797-3229. And then there is also a new sponsor, but I forget the name of it. It's, it's a deli. It's a... It's a a specialty food How store. could you forget the name of the deli? By the way, that was our guest calling in, so we'll get to him in a couple of minutes. But Woodrow, the Woodrow. The Woodrow. Well, you know, I do not live near the Woodrow, but I've heard about it. Uh-huh. Not so just I, from me, by the way. That's but, right. It, it is, a, it is a, like a landmark. It, it's been Hewlett. around for 40-something years in Hewlett, the Peninsula Shopping Center, for the most delicious cold cuts Chicken dishes, veal they've got. They've got a Romanian tenderloin that I love over there. I mean, it's a big slab of meat. A Romanian tenderloin? You, you've never had Rom- it? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not so tender if you've seen her recently. Sorry. Sorry, Olga. No, but I mean, plus hot dogs, french fries, hamburgers, knishes at the Woodrow Deli. I, I've been going there since we moved to Long Island, since I was 12 and a half. My family goes there a couple of times a month. And finally, now they're becoming sponsors. They're part of the neighborhood. So everybody, 
WoodrowDeli.com. And remember, there's only one W in Woodrow, and it's at the beginning. So it's WoodrowDeli.com. It's the Woodrow O. And, we're, oh, and the other thing that the owners keep stressing, and, and Norm has been there for 47 years, and... Um, Norm! Steve has been there for 30-something years. It's, like, it's just like Cheers. They do catering, and they'll rent out the place for parties, too. They're really trying to push that. So, folks, if you want to cater a party, you got a Thanksgiving coming up. You know, you've got the day... Well, Yom Kippur, you don't... Most people do dairy, so maybe not that, but circus yes, party. Most people don't eat on Yom Kippur, Dave. And what do you do the night? Era of Yom Kippur, and, you have a... <laughs> no, uh, night after. You break the fast for the big... Yes, uh, but Yom Kippur is actually from sunda sundown to sundown. All right, so, so. All right. are we going to argue about this or are we going to move yeah. on with the show? WoodrowDeli.com. And by the way, when Leave you... Leave off the last W for... Wow! <laughs> <laughs> for what? That's just terrible. Um, let's see. Do I have to tell you anything else? Well, oh, by the way, I'm reminding everybody once again to hear older episodes of Dave's Gone By. Why is that? Well, because they're free. You can listen to them anytime, 24-7, and you can skim through them. So if there's a dull part, like where you're talking, people can, <laughs> can jump over it. And, and, and listen, they're all at davesgoneby.org. Some are at the radio station website, and some are at... Um, davesgoneby.org. Literally, you click through the Total Theater website, but it's all at davesgoneby.org. You just click the little links. It's easy. I make it sound complicated. It's simple, and there's hours and you get to and see hours. a picture of you there. Several. I got a picture of you, too. That's so, try not to have your breakfast just before you <laughs> log on. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm being mean, but that's me. But so, are we, can we, can we, are we going to talk to David Stewart? Stewart? Stewart, Stewart, he's the executive editor of Backstage, and we're going to be with him in just a couple of minutes. But first, first, going to play the song. This is the song. You, you came in here feeling bad about uh, the economy. Uh, uh, I came in here feeling bad about... Did you, know, you write this the song? Or? This little ditty, I write it, wrote it, I sang it, God help us, and I played it on my little organ. <laughs> <laughs> Do you um, call it Dave? <laughs> actually, it's called Crappy Days Are Here Again. Banks are failing, feds are bailing, look at all the falling stock. War, inflation, dying nation, smashing upon Plymouth Rock. Crappy days are here again, the world is filled with fear again, our savings disappear again, crappy days are here again. Grab your money from the bank and hawk your clothes to fill your tank. We have George Bush and Greed to thank, crappy days are here again. My, how the deficit's grown, and good luck getting alone. See the banks go up in smoke, and all the brokers going broke. Just like the New York Mets, they choke. Crappy days are here again. Everybody's lost and numb, and frightened of the years to come. But there are no towers to leap from, crappy days are here again. One thing we all know for certain, no one's hurting at Halliburton. Crappy days will hit us hard, keep maxing out that credit card. While other countries we bombard, crappy days are here again. Everyone is sad and stressed, depression leaves us all depressed. America's been repossessed, crappy days are here again. Inside Broadway, brought to you by Performing Arts Insider and TotalTheater.com. Yes, we are back with Inside Broadway, and we're going in, in, into the Broadway season already. We've had a couple of openings here. We've had title of show, I think, was from this yes. season. And uh, let's see, we just had 13 opening tonight. Yes. And then uh, last week, well, and Tale of Two Cities, let's not forget that. Jill Santoriello was our guest last week. She uh, wrote and the music and the book for, uh, for Tale of Two Cities. Well, she didn't. 
really write the book. She kind of adapted <laughs> the book. <laughs> that's true. And well, that's what I was surprised when I saw that playbook. I said, oh, really? We're taking credit for the story of A Tale of Two Cities? Well, what? You can't, uh, who wrote uh, Lerner and Lowe? They don't take credit for, for Pygmalion? It says adapted. From, from well, George this is adapted, from, but it doesn't say adapted from anywhere. In the I mean, Bobliel Shul, oh, really? That she doesn't no. give credit to Charles? Dickens? No, we I was shocked because that, yeah. that was pretty funny. But we're not talking about Tell the Two Cities oh, tonight. We're talking about Equus, and we want to get our special guest on the phone. He's the executive editor of Backstage. Yes, the Backstage. His name is David Seward. First of all, let's let's make sure we have him there. Davey, there. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for holding. Thanks for... Uh, now, for David, is it the Backstage Magazine, or is it the Backstage Paper? It's a newspaper. Oh, I know it's a newspaper, but... And, and we have a website. But but do you call it just Backstage, or do you call it Backstage Newspaper? We call it Backstage. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you for, for clearing that up. I don't know. I just... <laughs> I mean, I, actually, one thing I do wonder about Backstage, of how mm -hmm. the balance is now. I don't know if you know these numbers or these figures, but... When I first started getting backstage, way back when I was an actor, there was no internet. It was just the newspaper. Yeah. Do you know what the balance is now? Of pe how many people actually still buy it on the stands or subscribe to it, as opposed to people who just subscribe on the web? Well, I do know that our uh, in New York, our circulation is twenty thousand. Oh. Uh, that doesn't include, you know, pass along. Uh, right. Where yeah. someone buys a copy and then they give it to a friend or whatever. Oh, I see. Uh, rocks about fifteen copies, just to save yeah. people money. Yeah. Right. And uh, on the web, we have like don't know the exact figures, but we get something like a million hits a month. So uh, that would be a million, you know, times yeah. that a person accesses the the the, um, the site. It may be one person doing it a couple of <laughs> times. <laughs> and and but, Nielsen owns you guys now, right? That's right. Cool. Cool. So, and you've been there. How long? Over a long years. time. Yeah. <laughs> About yeah. over 20 years. So you started... So since you were like nine, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> you, you started in what capacity there and now I, you're... Yeah. I was a part-time uh, editorial assistant when I started. Wow. Uh, I was an actor. I was trying to get it, making a living as an actor, and I thought, gee, I'll get all the... We, the thing with backstage is we have all the casting notices, and I thought, oh, I'll get a leg up on everybody, and I'll know what casting notices are coming in. Huh. And it just ballooned from there. And, of course, yeah. Sherry Eaker is a good friend of mine. She was mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of your predecessor, although you have a kind of a different job title, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, She is our editor at large. Okay. Are you on a cell or are you on a, a landline? I'm on a landline. Who? Where? Is this, is uh, in, in Queens. That's where oh, I live. Oh, your prize and rep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> needs, your, your line needs a little work. But, but uh, we got you. We're happy to have you. Can so, you hear me all right? Yeah, but I think you, what, you know what it was. It was like two or three times your 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 words kind of stopped because uh, you, it, the signal broke. Oh, okay. So, Do you want me to try another phone? No, no. Let, we're not right now. We're good. Yeah. We're, we're good. We're so okay. let's let's get on to Equus, which I think we all saw last week. So, I saw it two weeks ago. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. So who loved it? I loved it. Okay. Why? I loved this. Well, it's also memories for me because it was one of the first plays I ever saw. And, and it brought back a lot of good memories for me. And I love the play. I really do, even though I think it's a little dated. But it also, I, the only, my big problem was with Richard Griffith. Who plays the psychiatrist who is trying to unlock the key to why this rather disturbed young man blinded six horses in a stable where he was working. But I, and, and I love, I just, I really like the story and I like the way the, the whole show is written. Did you read the uh, author's notes in the playbill? No, I did not. Uh, it's very in in interesting that when he wrote the play, he was told the story, just the facts of the story, by a friend of his, that this trial was happening about this boy who blinded the horses. And then he he know, he knew it actually happened, but when he went to look into it, he, he either couldn't find it or something, and then his friend died, so he had no idea about the story. Everything he wrote is just all the... The facts about the story are all made up in his head, uh -huh, uh -huh, but okay. the, the actual situation is real. Now, Dave Schubert, do you, mm -hmm. I, no, um, Jeff, you saw it with Richard Burton on Broadway, am I yeah. correct? Dave, you saw it originally way back when it was what on its original tour. 
uh, it was in the I saw the touring production of the same. It was the same staging mm -hmm. that John Dexter did oh, uh, oh, on Broadway. Of, of the one that came to Broadway this time, yes. you saw it. Has it changed very much on its way to Broadway? Uh, no, no. I, what I'm saying is, oh, back in 1970 something, oh, 76 74. or so. Well, open, okay. When I was in high school, it was on tour in Philadelphia. The production that Richard Burton did. Oh, the Burton one. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, this was this was a tour of it, and it was starring an actor named Douglas Campbell, who was a Canadian actor, uh, who was playing the Richard Burton. The Anthony, uh, the, the role was originated on Broadway the by, Anthony, role. Right. by uh, Anthony Hopkins. Right. So, and yes, that, right. that I saw in Philadelphia. And by the way, other memorable people who played uh, it was Anthony Hopkins, Anthony Perkins did the role. Yeah. Anthony Perkins, right. Yeah. Uh, and the you know, psycho guy, yeah. And you know my favorite person who did the role? Who? Who did it for a long time? Leonard Nimoy. That's right. That's right, he did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's logical, actually. Um, so, <laughs> he did live long and prosper in that one. Yeah. So, David, what did you think of that original production that you saw, and then again, how compared to this one? Well, the original production, it w there were several elements that were very different. Uh, it's interesting that it's the same set designer. Uh, got John Napier? Yeah, Was John it? Napier. Mm -hmm. It's the same set designer, but in the original production from the 70s, the audience members were seated on the stage itself in this new mm -hmm. uh, staging there in a sort of a balcony above the stage behind the action. And it, it was very intimate, and you sort of had this feeling that uh, it was uh, that that everyone were were like students or medical students at a, at a at a lecture in a psychiatric hospital, and everything was like you were right there. Uh, Did it, you sit on stage? I know I, I sat in the audience. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, but it still it, it sort of gave the feeling that it was all happening right in front of you, and that it was play it was real life. Uh, and that this production is not quite as intimate. It's more the it's more removed and more theatrical. That's very true. It's almost more like a hospital setting or or well, a hospital operating theater because yeah. they've got audience members above the stage, right? Whereas looking it, down on it, yeah. Yeah. Whereas in the original production, they were right there on the stage, and all the members of the cast. Uh, came in and sat with the audience throughout right. the entire production. And, all, and also, if, if I remember correctly, they also talked in the round rather than... Here they kind of ignored those people. Yeah, there. yeah. And, 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 they, and it was like almost pleading a case to... It, I sat on the stage and I kind of almost felt like a juror. Mm-hmm. On the stage. Okay. Well, but again, you loved it. You thought it was well, pretty much. I like this because it brought it's, back it's, great yeah. memories. I think it's a great show. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, yeah. it's a very good production. Uh, I I do think, however, that the director Thea Shad, what Shad is it? Thea Shad. Shad. Mm -hmm. I think it's well. There are a couple things about it. I think that it, you you had mentioned uh, that it was a little dated, and I think that. The thing with this play is, and like all of Peter Schaffer's other plays, uh, it, it's sort of about the conflict between a sort of a sane, uh, regular, quote-unquote, normal person versus someone who's insane or perceived as mad but has a great passion, and there's sort of this envy and jealousy of, of the mad, passionate person for the sane, regular person. We see that in Amadeus, right. uh, where the Salieri is very normal and normal talent and he's wildly jealous of Mozart who is insane and scatological and uncontrollable kind of like me actually yeah, yeah but who has this uncontrollable talent although Mozart was talented, talented. thank you thank <laughs> yeah. you so much no I'm saying that Salieri yeah. was, no, I like but Mozart was even more talented no no we were just comparing well, oh, you were Dave, comparing Dave, Dave was kind of comparing himself to Mozart so he was yeah. comparing Lefkowitz to Mozart yeah, right. <laughs> not that big a stretch I don't yeah. think but, but um, as far as the datedness of the play the, what, what disappointed me when I saw Amadeus when they brought that back a few years ago with David Suchet they, they did a revival of that on Broadway and I remember seeing the original production not even with the original cast and thinking just how exciting there was something thrilling and theatrical about it and then seeing the revival and thinking wow there's a lot of narration here mm -hmm. and it didn't it just kind of sat there at mm -hmm. least with Equus although I didn't see the original production I knew the play I'd read the play I'd seen the movie years ago it was, for the most part, thrilling when it wasn't kind of silly or it wasn't a little boring and overwritten with speeches. The I other think, times were pretty exciting. I do think that the other thing about this compared to the original production 
is at this production is a lot more sexual. I mean, there is the sexual element in the boy's relationship with uh, the horses. Uh, mm-hmm. The horses, yes. And it comes in this production is very homoerotic. I mean, all the horses are played by these big, muscular, athletic actors with horse masks on. And there's a lot of uh, homoeroticism. But I thought it. it was the same in the, in the 70s. But but it was more, uh, they talked, I, I just had the feeling that it was more about uh, religion and worshipfulness and the fact that Alan, the boy who does the blinding, right. uh-huh. worships this God in his head, uh, of this animalistic God, of, and it was more about that sort of passion it was about that and a sexual oh. passion. Okay, yeah, because... Yeah, probably the, the religious aspect, too. The, well, the fact that they took down the poster of the Christ and right. re- put, right. replaced it with the horse. And in this production, I felt they w- there was an emphasis on the sexuality, which is part of it, but it's not all of it. Or as, he, as uh, Alan Strang calls it, the ha-ha. That's when he has his organ... Or well, this religious, ecstatic, horse equine... Uh, homosexual orgasm that he calls or, it. Or uh, beast, bestial, almost. Oh, well, uh, yeah. Or this uh, merging of yes. man with animal. Yeah, animals. and and that is what the the doctor, mm. uh, played by Richard Griffiths, envies. He envies uh, not necessarily this specific mm. thing, but a, a passion that right. he does not feel for his wife or for anything. I agree with Jeff about uh, Richard Griffiths. I wanted a little more from him. Mm. I understood what he was doing. He was trying to be late doc. He wasn't going to be Richard Burton with right. a sonorous voice. He was going to be like more of a schlubby guy. Well, but his projection that. is difficult. He lisps. Worse than I do. Um, and it was kind of, t- I kind of was like, come on, dude. Yeah, it was, the very beginning was very slow. The, the exposition took forever. Oh, that didn't bother me. See, I, I don't know, maybe it's because I, I know this, well, you knew the story too, so I don't know. Well, we all think of Harry Potter. I loved him, I thought Oh, he was, he was very good. Yeah, me too. I, was, <laughs> I, I was, It was very impressive for someone who had not done a lot of stage work. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the only play he had ever done was a guest shot in this uh, comedy thing. Uh, he did a little cameo in um, uh, the play What I Wrote, and he played himself oh, for oh, like a little, yeah. little bit. And, but I, I thought he was quite impressive for uh, someone who has not done a lot of stage work. And it's work. a tough role. Yeah, it's very he, difficult. It's a very difficult because part. Because a lot of this, his lines aren't even, are like partial words and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, and... Am I the only one, though, who had a real... Pro- one of my worst problems with this production was with Kate Mulgrew. Oh, uh, I hated her. <laughs> she was... Uh, you know, she had done a one-woman show off Broadway a few years ago when she played Catherine Hepburn, yep. and I thought she was doing Catherine Hepburn invitation. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There, there was being, one scene she was absolutely atrocious. I didn't I read, know what she was doing. Sorry? I, I, I read a review at some point of The Seagull, I believe, or that's... Or maybe it was something online that I read this where someone was saying, when you have American actors with British actors in a production mm-hmm. and everyone is supposed to be British and the Americans tend to be, to over, to compensate, get to be more British than the British. And I thought she was being so British and so proper, you know, let's all have some, some tea. Yeah. Uh, it, it sort of obscured uh, what she, uh, the, the intention of the role. Well, I don't. For, she came out like that, all stiff and British, and then she had a scene where she started literally like chewing the scenery, mm-hmm. and I, I was actually shocked. That's that's one of the worst things I've seen, um, especially in a major production that I generally liked. Mm-hmm. And, I got, what is, and and we got to kind of wrap this up, but you know, I remember I did community theater on Long Island. This is going back about 15, 20 years. And we were a traveling theater, so we'd go to libraries and community centers. And what we would do is take these cubes in one particular show we did. Oh, and yeah. we painted them first, and then and they became the chairs, they became the tables. And we, you know, we were always moving cubes every five minutes when a scene changed. Mm-hmm. And here I am, I'm on Broadway with, I'm assuming, a very expensive ticket, and a major new production with big stars in it, and they're moving cubes. Mm-hmm. Did that bother anybody else? Nope. Okay. Uh, I, I know what you, I mean, it, it's sort of the, 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 the one set is supposed to be different settings. It's supposed to be flexible and all that. Yeah. Uh, See, I it, like that. I like the fact that you had to, because <coughs> in essence, it's a story. It's, it's a, a man is telling a story, and, and you, you had to use all these different things for, the cubes are just, there was a desk, a couch, or this or that. It was in his home. It was it was in his office. It was at uh, the boys' home. Yeah, it's elemental. I mean, it, it's it, we shouldn't, as critics, we should be happy that we're using our imagination. I thought it was. I thought it was fine. I, I also thought the set was very similar to um, 
The original? The original one. The original one didn't spin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't remember the spinning. That was the extra half million dollars that they needed. So yeah. So, all in all, um, Dave, mm -hmm. you thought what about this Equus? I thought it was a very good production. Uh, some some very fun acting. You, know, uh, you know, some flaws uh, in some of the casting with Kate. Uh, well, in some of the performances with Kate Mulgrew, overdoing it with the British, with with being British, and uh, but very fine performances from Daniel Radcliffe and uh, Richard Griffiths. And uh, it's not as exciting. I mean. It's very strange when you reach, uh, I don't know everyone's age in this conversation, but you sort of reach an age where you've seen a lot of the shows that are on Broadway. Right. And because it's, it's, it's a safer bet to do revival, and you will have seen the original. And, uh, this to me does not compare. Uh, mm. it, it's okay, really? but it's not as good. And I think that someone who has not seen the original will have a whole different take on it. Cool. So that's funny. I, well, I, I figured it was just less because I was seeing it without Burton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just... Well, but, a, but Dave saw it not with Burton on I saw it with another actor. Yeah. I know, I know. That's what I'm saying. I just assumed that... But it could also be that this particular play, like maybe the other Peter Schaffer plays, like the first time you experience them, it's wow. And then once you know it, and then a few years go by, right. they're like, well, he's... he's a good writer, but he's also throwing smoke a lot at a time. Or we just, you know, um, the world has changed and we know a lot more. Whereas The Seagull, which also opened this week, is still fresh and exciting and vital, and there are things in it that are, that are new, depending on the, the production. I haven't seen, I'm looking forward to it. I'm seeing uh, this week. So I've heard only, ra well, yeah. I've read a couple of near raves, but, um, so that's coming up this week. And just um, to, to finish off with David Seward, the executive editor of Backstage, you're also a member of the Drama Desk, you're former president of the That's Drama right. Desk, and you've written a couple of books. Please tell us what they are and how we can get them. Oh, um, uh, did you say books? You, you made a funny, uh, I didn't quite... Yes, books. I do have a new book coming out uh, in, in about a week or so. Ooh. It is a biography of George C. Scott. Wow. It's it's called Rage and Glory, The Volatile Life and Career of George C. Scott. And it is the first complete biography of him. Uh, uh, there, there, hasn't been, there was a book written about him in the 70s, uh, but that is out of print. And uh, it is published by Applause Theater and Cinema Books, and it will be out in bookstores in a week. In, in a week. That's wonderful. And available, obviously, on Amazon. And, yes, on and Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com and at, at finer bookstores everywhere. Well, and what is the title of that again? Okay, it's called Rage and Glory, The Volatile Life and Career of C. Scott. Well, just substitute Scott's name for mine and, and you basically have my name, too. Well, it's been glorious no, to talk to you. Was, yours is rage and, uh. <laughs> and desperation. <laughs> there, you oh, there you go. Thank you. David Seward, congratulations on the book. Um, you know, great work, continuing work on backstage, of course. Thank and, you. And best of luck with all your endeavor. Are you also on New York One still? I know you used to be yes. on. Oh, wh when can people catch you there? I'm on New York One uh, on their show on stage, which is on Saturdays and Sundays at 2.30 in the morning and 7.30 at night. What time? 2.30 in the morning, did you say? No, no, 7.30 in the morning. Uh, sorry, you got me all mixed up. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can your your mic on your uh, telephone. Well, we out. heard you. We were uh, you were on at thirty in the morning. <laughs> oh, it's 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 uh, New York One on stage on New York One, uh, and it is on nine thirty in the morning, and seven thirty at night on Saturdays and Sundays. Cool. And I'm on every other week, and it's also on Monday nights at nine thirty and uh, twelve thirty a.m. on Monday nights. I suppose you have a website where people can kind of look all this info up. Um, well, we have backstage dot com okay. where I have a blog. That's it. Backstage.com for all the information you need to know about David Seward and also thanking you so much for being in the neighborhood and being part of Inside Broadway reviewing Equus. We're back with uh, Dave's Gone By and also a little bit more of Inside Broadway because we can get to the news. We normally do the, the theater news first and then go on to the reviews and stuff. And by the way, just, just uh, you know, everybody heard Jeff scream at me, say goodbye because I can... Um, I, I never did a proper goodbye to David Seward, but Seward literally call, called back and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to say goodbye to you. So we both <laughs> said goodbye to each other while the commercial and the music was playing. So we're all, we're all tidy and we're, we're all, all squared, squared away. <laughs> so let's get squared away with the news of Broadway. In What's the news on the Rialto, Dave? Well, let's see. This is kind of big enough to be Broadway, but it's not technically Broadway. Cirque du Soleil has got another show coming back to New York. They're going to be doing something called Kuza. 
Uh, yep, I mean, how many have they done? We have th- we had that already. We have two already. I don't think so. And I couldn't make a, a well, joke on that title for quite a while. It's not. Yes, that is show. correct. Um, the one here are the two things that make it a little bit uh, interesting. First of all, it's more they say of an old style Cirque show mm-hmm. in the sense that. I mean, we've seen the Cirque du Soleil shows in Vegas, and they're pretty spectacular. Love them. O and Ka were phenomenal. Literally. I'm at the Vegas Love. I'm sorry? Love. I, you saw Love. I didn't get to see Oh, love. you didn't see the... Oh. I mean, but from what I saw, my mouth was agape, and I've seen thousands of things, and I've seen uh, enough Cirque du Soleil to last me a lifetime, but seeing them in Vegas was something... Not me. I, can, I could see them every week. I love well, them. come to see... Kuza, one that opens in April on Randall's Island in New York. But here's the deal. This one is going to be a little more old-fashioned of just stunts and acrobatics and aerials and more comedy, more clowning. The reason I'm kind of interested is the person who wrote this version and directed it is a guy who started with Cirque du Soleil originally and branched out from there and eventually was part of the team that created Full Moon, David Shiner. Oh, really? First time I saw David Shiner was with Cirque du Soleil, oh, and he he did that movie routine there, and that's when I knew he was going to be huge. I mean, yeah. people were falling all over themselves laughing. So I'm very interested to see what he does with Kuza, hopefully more than he did with Susical. <laughs> well, you know. Yes, you remember he was the original Susical before yeah. um, Ro- Rosie O'Donnell Rosie took over. And... So that's coming in April, and little story just for you, Jeff. Guess what's coming to Las Vegas in May? Some sort of this big Vegas Oh, purple. oh, oh, I know. Um, oh, oh, I know. Oh, oh, Young Frankenstein? No. no. Oh, no, that, no, I'm not doing the monster. I'll, I'll do more about Wait. audio. Oh, I heard Roar. you. Oh, I... Oh! Bum, 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 bum. No, that's Little Mermaid, sorry. Um, what the hell Oh, that's that? right, the Lion King. Thank you, yes. I should have done the warthog noise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would never get it. Yeah, but, I, but it's coming to take over the place where Mamma Mia was. Mandalay Bay? Yeah. Mandalay Bay, it's opening in Vegas May 2nd. So, and this is a real, this is not just a little tour thing. This is a big Vegas yeah. Lion King, well, along with uh, New York, London, Hamburg, Paris, Tokyo, and I hope I pronounced this right, Fukuoka are the only places that have actual Lion King sit-down productions. So they're, now Vegas is going to get one in May. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I'm so thrilled that finally a show, a theater is kind of being accepted. And they, they said it's going to be the full production. I don't know if that well, means yeah. the, um, if it's going to have an intermission, it's going to be more than 90 minutes. Oh, I see what you mean. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. But, you know, Mamma Mia did very well. It's closing in January at Mandalay Bay. So it recouped it did Bay. well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. And, and I think Mandalay Bay is going to keep theater alive there because... My God, Stamlot died, uh, producers died. Right, the uh, producers of all things. Q, really Yeah, no, that really away. didn't do well at all. Hairspray, how did, did that come even? No, or? Hairspray didn't come. Oh, okay. It was but supposed that, to Actually, be. I have news about Hairspray. What's the Hairspray news? Oh, yes. I, ha- the, I, I heard this rumor. I heard this good and bad rumor. Good po- good part of the it's rumor. It's not a rumor, it's true, but go Harvey Firestein is coming back to Hairspray. Yes. But it's closing in January. That's not rumor. It's both true. Oh, is Hairspray it? is going to close. They don't have an exact date, but it'll be first or second week of January. And sometime between now and then, probably towards the end, Harvey Firestein is going to go back in for a couple of weeks as Edna Turnblad, mm-hmm. the, the mother character, now being played by George Wendt of mm-hmm. uh, Cheers fame. See yeah. how it all circles back? We mentioned Norm before. Yeah. It's, it's, I love how that but, works. And yes. then also this weekend we, we lose title of show. Or next weekend we lose title of the show. Right? One of these, yeah. And Xanadu closed early. That was sad. That closed like end of September. Well, it's tough it was times, to close dude. This weekend and they they closed it a week early. Like two or it. three weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because they were hem- a show starts to hemorrhage money. Yeah. They're gonna let it go. But well, here's I mean, one show that is doing all right. What's that? Here uh, here is a Broadway show that is actually doing okay. Which better one? than okay? Boeing, Boeing. Boeing Boeing recouped its investment, didn't they? That's right. $2.6 uh, million dollars recouped the investment this week. So somebody's making money out there. Well, that's, that's good. It's a very odd thing. for it, It's a non-musical. For a play to be doing that well. Um, and, and also some news about Boeing Boeing. Two of the original cast members are going to be leaving. Catherine Hahn, you might know her from uh, Crossing Jordan. 
she plays one of the Stuart I, mm-hmm. and Gina Gershon is also leaving. Mm-hmm. They're going to be replaced, respectively, by Paige Davis. You remember her from the Trading Spaces, yeah. and she's done Chicago and stuff like that? She, she's doing the role of okay. uh, Han had. And replacing Gina Gershon will be Rebecca Gayhart. Mm. So, you know, sort of a semi hottie alert there, kind of. Okay. Okay. Mark Rylance is staying in. That's the main, that's, that's the, the important, important part. Mark Rylance was there. You, you have to see it. That's the, the thing. I'm trying to think. There was, a, what, it was around the news, Dave? No, that, that, those are basically those are the big, the big, big news. It wasn't a big week because, remember, Jewish holidays and also any, there's a freeze now because people are waiting to see what's happening with the market. So producers are thinking, well, are we going to keep stuff running? There what, was what? one news that I was upset about. What, 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 what? My pal Chester Gregory is no longer in Shrek. Oh. He got replaced as Donkey. They have a new Donkey. Oh, now do you know Chester Gregory yeah. personally? Oh, wow. I met Chester when he was doing when he was doing hairspray. He was like the best seaweed ever. He could, <laughs> well, he, that'll be on his tombstone, you know. Best seaweed ever, nineteen fifty eight through. No, know. he 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 came in. He totally, you know, came in as a, a young kid. His first thing. But man, he tore up the stage of seaweed. Well, I, I was the fifth best seaweed ever, well, and I'm 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 relatively proud of that, you know. Considering you're not black, and I'm not. Probably, and you can't oh sing my God. or dance. <laughs> but um, anyway, but but he he then he left hairspray and he went and he did crybaby. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's going to be in something else, isn't he? Uh, well, he was going to be in Shrek. Oh, so you're saying he left Shrek, or he's? I'm not sure. All of a sudden, I I, I saw something that said he's no longer in Shrek. Ooh, they okay. have a new donkey. I was oh, so uh, excited for him. Well, that's a that's a kick in the ass, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have oh my god, it's 11:45, and we have still so much more to do on this program. So let's wrap up in some okay. where we kind of have and get to Carol. Let's close the windows. The la 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 ladies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the beginning. The la la la. We go. Hey, did you notice that I changed the um, the intro music to Inside Broadway? My wife has been hawking me for months that she found oh, the... Hold on. Excuse me. We've had a Dave is not gay moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, because I mentioned my wife? Yes. And the fact that she said that that intro music was really, really gay. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's music from the musical Nine. It goes, la, 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 la. La 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 la, and and my wife Joyce was just like, Dave, you have to change that music. La la la. la. Now now we have some real fuerte kind of man music, although the the end kind of stuff is from the Music Man. You'll hear it. It goes like this. Gentle. We've just been inside Broadway, thanks to TotalTheater.com and Performing Arts Insider. Hi, this is Carol Edmonston, and I am here today with Days Gone By, and I am the niece of the late Sid Hoff, the acclaimed children's author and cartoonist, and I want to welcome you to WGBB Freeport. Welcome back to Days Gone By on WGBB, and um, I want to talk a little bit about cartoons and things like that. I think if I wanted to be drawn by a cartoonist, to be lampoon, sort of caricatured, but in a loving way. There, there, there's a couple that I might want to go with. Like, I don't know about the Doonesbury people, uh, Gary Trudeau, because they're kind of pointy looking and a little shifty looking, even the nicer ones. Mm, some of the political cartoonists would just be evil, like that guy in the New York Post when one of them going near me, but Sid Hoff. If, granted, he would probably make me a little tubbier than I am. I mean, I could stand to lose a few pounds. He'd probably pack 20 pounds on me. But he'd make me look so cute with those like big round eyes and all these round kind of bowling ball bowling pin curves. Now, I think I would make a re- really adorable Sid Hoff character. Now, if you don't know who Sid Hoff is or was, then you don't remember your childhood. You don't remember Danny and the Dinosaur or Sammy the Seal or uh, I, I wish I'd known about Lengthy the Long, Long Dog as a, a dachshund owner that I am. But someone who does know and does remember the late Sid Hoff is um, his niece, Carol Edmondson, and she's here in the neighborhood to talk about her uncle. Hello, Carol. Hi, Dave. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's a, it's a little warm in my neighborhood. When we're, when is your, we're in the neighborhood. See, I'm Dave, so this is the neighborhood. 
the, uh, the kind of bad puns we make when we're not cartoonists. But where, where are you? My, the Carol Hood is in Southern California, <laughs> not far from Disneyland. Oh, oh, not so. So how how hot is it? Today it it it, it feels hotter than they predicted. I would certainly say it's in the in the eighties. Oh, okay. Not too bad. Okay, enough about the weather. Let's talk Uncle. Uncle Sid. When was the first time you met Sid Hoff? My goodness, as soon as I, I remember being introduced as a young child to an uncle that would visit it, just as a very young child, uh -huh. um, they lived, you know, in, in Long Island in Bell Harbor and would come to California a lot. So as a little girl, I was a very, very close uncle. Okay, and... and you would see him at family gatherings, or, or how often would you see Uncle Sid? Well, you know, Sid traveled the world doing his shtick. You know, he would travel doing uh, presentations at schools and libraries, and he had a very close, he and his wife had a very close relationship with my parents, so they would be in California at least once a year. So oh, I saw him quite often. With, so what was your impression of him? I mean, at what point, since you knew him as a tiny kid, at what point did you realize he was kind of famous and also that he was a cartoonist in all these newspapers and all these books all over the world? Well, you know, I always knew he was a cartoonist because he always sent us his books, but the books that I remember as a young child were the adult cartoon books. Um, I, I assume they weren't that adult. Well, no, you know, and I'll tell you the thing, he has such a recognizable style in, in, in art, as you were explaining at the beginning, it's very simplistic, he used a lot of bold color, and all his characters were, were just very simple, simply drawn, so I was always drawn to the covers of his books, I, the adult cartoons I didn't really care about. My brother and I, I think when we were maybe close to eight, ten years old, is when he wrote his first children's book that we remember, which is very out of print now, called Muscles and Brains. Hmm. Um, but we always just knew him as, as our uncle, who happened to have been as funny as my parents. I think it wasn't until my, my son, who's now in his 30s, was a youngster, that, and I used to arrange for to do his chalk talks, his little shticks at the schools, and I all of a sudden recognized him as a performer who also was my uncle, and I was amazed at, at the gift that he was able to, to give the children, really to inspire them and, and uh, teach them how they could become their own cartoonists in their own world. Was he a sweetheart, or was there kind of a darker side that you didn't see in the drawings or you didn't see in the personality, even among the family gatherings? No, he was always just a really loving, loving uncle. I, I think the part that has intrigued me in, in my discovery, um, for me, I wanted to honor his rich legacy, and I developed and created the website Sidhoff.org. And so in the process of doing my research, I discovered so much about the man behind the dinosaur, behind Danny and the dinosaur, that his his political beliefs as a young cartoonist long ago in the, in the 30s, so... That whole part of Sid has, is very intriguing to me because he really had a lot to say and was able to take pen and paper and, and express his, his political views in the world. Well, what were they and how did they differ from the prevailing sentiment of the early 30s? Well, I tell you, you know, they would be very relevant today. Um, you know, long ago when he had sold his first cartoon to The New Yorker at the age of, of 18, at about that time... He also, um, you know, was living in and had bohemian roots in Greenwich Village and with a lot of his um, his classmates would go to the Cafe Society, uh, which was started by Barney Josephson, and that was a, a political cabaret and a lot of satire on the upper class. And Sid actually lent his, his artwork to the walls in, in Cafe Society, um, which was, you know, a lot about... Um, just a spoof on that upper class, and he actually penned a whole book under a, a, a pseudo name uh, called the Ruling Clause, C L A W S S. Um, yeah. Just really in support of the working class. Hmm. And I mean, at a certain point, because of his success, he moved well past the working class. Did that cause any conflict? I mean, did he always see himself as a Nine to five working class man, or was there a point when you put in your third swimming pool, you realize it's almost a little hypocritical? 
Well, I think he recognized, you know, when Danny and the Dinosaur came out in 1950, it's actually its 50th anniversary, um, celebrating its 50th anniversary, it came out in 1958, that he recognized with the huge success of that book, it was time for, for him to move on and, and you know, um, honor the gift that, that he was recognized for in, in really inspiring children at a very young age to, to read. Hmm. And, you know, so time changes, and um, he, he, he moved on along with it. He did, he did write an amazing book on editorial, editorial and political cartooning in 1976 that, that he featured 700 cartoons from about 165 cartoonists, um, which, you know, just really wanting to honor what these political cartoonists have to gift the world. Did he, do you think he had any kind of a rivalry, or maybe he knew and had a friendship with Dr. Seuss? Well, I, you know, he did not personally know him, but they certainly knew of one another. Um, and they certainly penned cartoons for, for um, the same publications here and there, um, but, they, but they, he did not have the pleasure of meeting him. Hi, this is Carol Edmondston, and I am the niece of the late Sid Hoff, the acclaimed children's author and cartoonist, and I'm here today with Dave W.G.B.B. Freeport. We're talking with Carol Edmondston, who is the founder and the, I guess, the publisher of SidHoff.org, and that's Sid, S-Y-D-H-O-F-F, Sid Hoff, the famous and kind of beloved cartoonist, both for children and grown-ups. What are some things that would surprise us that uh, we wouldn't know about him or guess about him from the kind of drawings that he did? Uh, well, what surprised me in, in, in my research on Sid is, you know, how involved he was, you know, as, as a young man in the political arena and standing up for causes. William Randolph Hearst actually declared his um, cartoon strip called Tuffy about a little girl who did funny things in, uh, important for national morale during World War II. So that kept Sid from from serving actively um, hmm. in the, in the um, armed services. However, Sid, you know, long ago wanted to take off to to Spain to help fight in the Spanish Civil War. I think I think this is part where the expression "oy vey" came from in my family because my my grandmother was, you know. The ice bag came out to be put on her head for her high blood pressure, and she didn't want to see him taken off for Spain, so um, he tempered some of his, you know... I, I never understood that. Somehow all the artists and intellectuals of, of that era felt like they had to go run off and fight in Spain. I've never before or since seen any kind of a war or conflict. You don't see Hollywood movie stars running to Darfur putting on, you know, ammo, yeah, just something about the Spanish American War was so, I don't know, uh, politically romantic a absolutely. to those people. You yeah. know, um, there were many. He went down, I think, to the pier to see off his friends that were going over there, and most of them did not come home. Um, those those early days, you know, with the rise, with Hitler's rise to power. Um, you know, I think even Sid, there was a quote of his, he said, you know, he had that urge to do battle with evil. It became irresistible. Um, so he did what he, he felt he could considering, you know, uh, the, the wife, the children, the, the parents, and, you know, everything he needed to balance his life with. Did he live a long life? Sid? Yeah. He passed away in 2004 at the age of 91, so he nice. had a rich, a rich, rich life. Was he ended he, up uh, contributing about 571 cartoons to The New Yorker, nearly 200 books, um, some of which he, he did the artwork and, and didn't write, but most of them he wrote. He's done uh, several books with Alan Sherman on Hello Mudda, Hello Fada. Oh, that? yes, of course. He, he did the artwork for that. And Al Campanis, who used to be one of the managers of the Los Angeles Dodgers, he, he did the artwork for, for uh, Roger the Dodger. So... He, and he's done a lot of books that have uh, have been based on true stories um, about Thomas Nast, political cartoonist, and the SBCA and Al Capone. So he's he's really kept himself, you know, in as a bridge builder. I look at him. He really touched many different generations and different socioeconomic classes. And, and was he drawing and active 
to right to his late 80s and 90s, or was he like out of commission towards the last few years? Oh, I think it was just about the last, you know, three years, uh, four years, you know, of, of his life where physically, you know, it was a little challenging for him. But well into his 80s, this man was still sending ideas to HarperCollins for, for new books. Well, that's cool. That's, so when was the last time you met him, saw him? Um, well, physically saw him, um, it was when he was in his 80s. I mean, he was still coming out here, actually. I, I certainly have always kept in touch with him on the phone. Um, even in the, his last few years of his life, I would be on the phone with him maybe once a week, a couple times a month. Um, he was he was a very, you know, he adored his younger, my mother was eight years younger, and um, there was a very close relationship. So he's been a very close uncle, even though there have been 3,000 miles, you know, between us. Because he was, he lived in New York the whole time, pretty much. Well, he he lived in New York, and then in a, about 1950, he, he fled the cold country and went oh. down to Miami Beach. Well, that's where the Jews go. That's what yeah. we do. Yeah, yeah. okay. Any, any uh, last words with uh, Carol Edmonston, who administers SidHoff.org? Any really memorable anecdotes or stories about the life of cartoonist Sid Hoff? Well, I, I always like to share this story. My parents, as I said, traveled with Sid and, and his wife a lot, so they were on a they were on a cruise once. They they were in Spain. They had stopped and got off the boat and went to a restaurant to get something to eat and. Sid really wanted to have some smoked salmon, and the four of them, none of them could speak the language. There was a language barrier, so Sid did what Sid knows how to do. He he took out a pen, and on the linen <laughs> tablecloth, he sat there, and he drew a picture of a salmon with a pipe in its mouth and the smoke <laughs> coming up, and in five minutes, the man had his smoked salmon. <laughs> So, Marvelous. You know, th this is a great gift in having the ability to, to use that pen and paper and, and get what it is you, you, you want and need. And <laughs> lovely, lovely. And, and thank you, uh, Carol Edmondson, for bringing us the gift of his memory of Sid Hoff's cartoons. And his. Can people go to SidHoff.org and see what can they see there? Oh, I hope, I hope your listeners do visit SidHoff.org. There's... There's a tremendous amount up on that website. In fact, there's an 18-page autobiography that Sid wrote in 1988. There are some of his cartoons, some family pictures, some articles, some interviews. There's actually uh, an interview that was done by the Japanese version of Esquire magazine. I have no idea. Huh. No idea what it says at all, but it's up on that website, Dave. <laughs> well, um, good. All the political stuff about Sid is what I'm hanging on to, hopefully, to turn around and spin in a book. There's the book list is up there. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of, of reading. And the mural that he painted for the Cafe Society in New York long ago is actually, there's a picture of it on the website because I discovered it with his signature missing in a local restaurant that reproduced hmm. it 41 times. So... I'm still trying to find this, um, this where the original is. Where the original, which I believe is floating somewhere around, you know, in the Hamptons. It was owned by uh, Randolph Duke at one time, the fashion designer, who sold it about eight, ten years ago to uh, an antique dealer back there. So, it all of that is up on the website as well. Hmm. Sidhoff. Dot org. That's the place to go. Can you buy any of his books there, or do you have to go to Amazon and eBay and places like that? Well, the best place that you can go, um, I found most of his books through a lot of the um, places like Abe, A-B-E, abebooks.com. You put his name in, and many of them will come up. Yeah. Ex Libris also? The, the right. Kinds of, yeah, okay. Right. There's, there's, I, I was surprised you could spend an entire day combing through and finding uh, his books. Well... Worth it, I would think, to see his images, to see his designs, and his words, too, since he wrote a lot of the books, and very much worth it to hear about him from his niece, Carol Edmonston. Thank you so much for joining us in the neighborhood. My pleasure. You have a great day, Dave. Hi, this is Carol Edmonston, and I am the niece of the late Sid Hoff, the acclaimed children's author and cartoonist, and I'm here today with Dave W.G.B.B. Freeport. Dave's gone by, 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 D
there goes the neighborhood, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you've been enjoying this episode of Dave's Gone By as we hey, move Dave. into Monday morning. Yeah. Jeff. I didn't know your last name was GBB Freeport. <laughs> well, it's on GBB Freeport. That's, that's our legal ID, right? The WGBB Freeport. Well, she said you're listening to Dave G- WGBB Freeport. Yeah, because I think she, there was something I had to edit in the middle of that, and I kind of had to lump it together. But I do want to thank so much Carol Edmonston and for, for uh, her lovely chat about Sid Hoff. And to find out more about that, where do I have her, um, her email in front of me? SidHoff.org. Then yeah, I would do it. S-Y-D. I'll just look it up <laughs> in the phone book. That's true, but remember, it's SYDHoff.org. And also her own website is SacredDoodles.com. Two Ds in there. Sacred, actually there are three Ds. SacredDoodles.com. The four Ds, because the D in sacred, huh? Let's count those D's again, Jeff. <laughs> Sacred, one, do, two, two, dull, three. Oh, three yeah, D's. Two, oh. That's right. I mean, it's easier for me because I've got the paper in front of me. But, okay. See, this is like our downtime. We, we've done most of the important part of it. We've done pretty much all the important part of the show. Now, Jeff and I get to unwind a little bit. We can we can hang out a little bit. Let's call what's-his-name back. Uh, <laughs> what's David, his? He's probably sleeping at work Seward. in the morning, though. But I want to thank David Seward so much for being so interesting and so um, knowledgeable. knowledgeable about the theater and about Equus. And, and everybody, go get his new book about George C. Scott. It's coming out next What's week. What's it called? First major bio of George C. Scott. It's the rage and the something. Glory. Glory. Glory and rage. Rage and glory. Look at like a TV show with um, that woman from Regis and Kelly Ripa, something like that. I don't know. Wasn't she on Hope and Glory? Come on, work with me on this. That was Hope and Faith. Hope it, was it really? Hope and faith? <laughs> Wasn't there an And Glory TV show as well? Somewhere? Sometime? Ooh, Somewhere? Glory days. Sometime? There'll be glory a rage and <laughs> glory. Let's do some... Oh, let's let's do our sponsors now instead of waiting until 1 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to get them out of the way. So we, we, we like to tell people about the folks who support this show and invite you to advertise and become... Well, you have to. If you like the show, show, you have to support them. That's right. Otherwise, there's no show. So, everybody so, support Hewlett Minuteman Press. They are... The copy kings of Broadway. 10% off any job, big or small, for Dave's Gone By listeners. At if I come Man in Press, and yeah. want a seven-cent copy, how much yeah. would it cost me? Well... With my 10% off. It would probably be, uh, let's see, for one page, I don't know if you could get a... Well, maybe you could. Maybe a five-cent copy or something like that. And then but it would be ten percent off. That so you probably get it for six cents or or five or six cents. No six. There you go. Then you can see dead people. <laughs> the six cents. So I was like very good. But if you had a hundred dollar job, then it would be only ninety. If you had a thousand dollar job, it'd be only nine hundred. So being and a if that job was eighty seven fifty, how much, Dave? Well, you, it'd be eight dollars and seventy five cents less than eighty seven fifty. You do the math. I don't know. You do it. No. Okay, <laughs> then there am I. I answer the question. But well, the folks at Hewlett Minuteman Press will do the math for you because they're going to give you that discount if you're a Dave's Gone By listener. Stop in. Go get printing done, binding done. Put your, your logo on mugs, on pens, on keychains. Get your, well, your little late Talk for the Rush of cards. You can do Halloween cards, Thanksgiving cards, and Christmas cards. Hanukkah cards. That's right. Hewlett Minuteman Press, 1315 Broadway in Hewlett. Next to what was the defunct Loman Shoe Store. That's right. There's no more Loman Shoes, but there's plenty of printing to be done. That <laughs> minute, man. Oh, and let's see. Also, our sponsors, the Woodrow Delicatessen. Woodrow. Woodrow. I call it Woodrow. So when people look for it on the internet, they leave off that second W that should be there but isn't because it's leave Woodrow. off the second W for annoyance. Yeah. No, we got to work on that a little more. We're leaving for, the for second... W for roast beef. <laughs> Whiskey. W for a warm way to spell this. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something. The Woodrow Delicatessen, it's one of the best delis on Long Island, which makes it one of the best delis in New York, which makes it one of the best delis in the whole country and the world. Fabulous food. Fresh. Everything there. It's that, freshly made. That yeah. roast beef is so fresh you want to slap it. <laughs> but I'm um, <laughs> Roast beef, pastrami, brisket. Pastrami is the only thing they can't make on site. Why is that? Because they have day? to be smoked. They need a smokehouse. But all the other mm. turkey, freshly baked off the bone. They, they, mm. And you can't smoke in the store. <laughs> <laughs> no smoking. 
they they were after all that you can't even get a glass of wine. I think they still serve that. So if you want a little wine with your dinner, they, they got, got a wine wine license. It. They got. I guess they must. It's a nice place. It's a Hamish homey neighborhood kind a of a nice day. place, a good place, right? Right. Right. With I promise people. you'll be happy. And let me tell you, know why you'll be happy also? Because Mr. Fiddler on the Roof, man. Because. <laughs> Okay, you know, you think a sandwich is kind of expensive with kosher meat. It's really, you know, they charge it a little more than you would get. Two fifty a sandwich, I hear. No. Oh. Look at this, nineteen seventy. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But you go there, okay? You sit down. Let's say you have, uh, you're with a friend. You have two sandwiches. They also just throw bowls of pickles at you, and and coleslaw, and you also get a big thing of bread. And you get it all together, and, and and with a beverage, it's like a restaurant. The two of you will get out of there for thirty dollars, you know. Now, what other kinds of restaurant are How you? How much there? of course you get in? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on, to, you're on fire, Mister Goodman. The Woodrow, a place so fresh you want to slap it. There you go, something like that. Well, I would give a tagline. Yeah, leave off the last W for a whoops. <laughs> or, or, hmm. Where is it again? Where? Peninsula Shopping Center. No, leave off where, the last, where, uh, last leave off the last W for where is it again? The Peninsula Shopping Center. I know, but leave off the last W for where is what's it again? A, yeah, but what's a W food? What's a W food? Ooh, wow. Well, I, I'm blanking. This wasabi. Wasabi. Yeah, well, they have horseradish. You can order horseradish with your... I don't know if they have gefilte fish. They have... Stuffed cabbage. And it's delicious. That's stuffed armor? Oh, yeah. Good stuffed armor. They're good french fries. Their onion rings, sometimes really good, sometimes not so. I've called them all that. So Dave is not, not recommending the onion Not rings. necessarily. Ask the waiters. The waiters will tell you everything. And, and, and what's the owner's name, good. Steve? Norm. Norm. Norm and Steve are the two owners. Norm basically started the place. So you have to go, so you have to walk in the place and go, Norm! Well, yeah. Just, just like Cheers. Just like Cheers. And... There'll be Norm. He'll probably be at the register, or Steve will. Go buy a van. Or you go up to the counter, get a great hot dog, get a delicious. Oh yeah, I got such a headache. <laughs> buy a van. So, on to the next sponsor because it's, it's not fair to just talk about the Woodrow. We've been on them for about four minutes. So let's that's okay. I'm just trying to figure out what we're last, leaving the last W off for. <sighs> let's have a contest if our viewers can our viewers. Our listeners, yeah, or can can think of. Uh, then I will pay, tagline. I, I will personally pay for lunch at the Woodrow for two if we get a good tagline from that. Is room. nice, man. That is a great contest. Think think of a great tagline. It doesn't have to be the W thing, although that would be really good. But if you think of a really good motto, a slogan for the Woodrow, because if you go on their website, they have a website, and it, it's they don't, it's good, but they need a little sizzle. They need a little, they need a little oomph. Yeah. So give them that oomph. Come up with a really a slogan, a tagline that all of us go, wow. And Jeff, this is a promise. Jeff is going to buy you lunch, lunch for two. two at the Woodrow Delicatessen. That's pretty cool. I like that. See? So get and email your entries to Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. That's D A V as in Victor, E S. Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. And get them to me by next week. Saturday. By Saturday, and then be, we'll have the winners on Sunday. But next are. month is fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We're, we're, we're doing this a little late. Creative night. genius takes time. I think we should run the contest for like a month or two. You th well, um, let's see. Well, we're just beginning of October. Let's let's do it until the end of October. No, but next week is already the the twelfth. Yeah, and then the. So 20th. I think maybe we should go to like till Thanksgiving. It's a lot a long time. Well, they have to think about it. We don't want to. No, no, no. You, uh, we don't just want any take two months to think about. They think about it. It either pops in their head and it works, or it doesn't. We're not asking them to write five chapters of a novel. Well, if we it's, don't like any of the slogans, then nobody wins. Then we extend the contest. Okay, okay. If we only get then we go to November. But if we get one that really works, that really pops, someone's going to get a free lunch on Jeff. And who, uh, says there's no, that. Who's, <laughs> <laughs> who says there's no free lunch? There you go. Moving on, speaking of Jeff, you do what in your daytime? In your, your What's your regular job? I do decorate parties. Toilets? Parties. Oh, parties. Yes, how do you decorate parties? Nicely. <laughs> yeah, and... 
Do you paint the walls? No. Do you put up streamers? Sometimes. Oh, okay. Let's see, what else? How else? Do you put up potted plants and flowers? No, but sometimes we move them around. Okay. To make room for what? Balloons! <laughs> and? More balloons! And? More balloons! And centerpieces! <laughs> I was just watching you. You're <laughs> so frustrated. You get the <laughs> and, and? Well, because yeah, I you know whether you, you're looking at me. I know you said balloons, but centerpiece. I'm more impressed by centerpiece. The balloons, you blow up balloons, you tie them together, big, big whoop. But you, the, the balloon sculptures are amazing. They are, but they're all sort of... I'm more impressed at uh, the arts and the craftsmanship it takes to make centerpieces, because you do these designs... Or the foam core, the glitter. I'm yeah. the glitter king of the world. What are some of the recent um, themes that you've done for parties? Or well, in the past we've done, two months? Well, we can't say that I've done Disney, because I can't do that without authorization. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oops. You did Disney-esque stuff. Oh, well, we just we took an order. We're doing your favorite theme, Balls. Big what? What? <laughs> what? Wait, oh, P.S., we need, we need a, what is it when you put a, a something, a legal thing on it? A, a disclaimer? We need a disclaimer here. Just to know, just to make everyone know Dave is not gay. Oh, yeah, no, we must, not We must here. put a legal disclaimer on here. <laughs> but you, you can't honestly be having a party where the theme, the design theme is testicles. No, Even Tim Paul. Gunn, much as he would no, like Paul. to see that, but no, okay. You know what? You know what we do? What? We make it work. Yeah. Oh, okay. We <laughs> give Tim Gunn. No, but wait, wait, wait. So you have? Um, it's, it's about basketballs, hot sports balls. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Fair enough. You've also done what? Simpsons parties, haven't you? Or yeah, but we can't say them. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Once again. I see. So all the generic. So we do a lot theater of sports. Themed, yeah. Theater, Broadway, New York. Okay, New York themed. Got it. We do. Oh, Mardi Gras. Oh, nice. Okay. A purple, gold, and green. Yeah, that must look it's nice. nice. Okay, what's well, a party? I like it. See, Jeff actually does have. We do New Year's parties. Yeah, we'll be doing. I'm working on the the Temple Temple Benet Torah's New Year's party now. Ooh, where are they located? They're on Jerusalem Avenue in Montoy. Oh, oh, okay. Not not that you work out of Massapequa somewhere. So. People in that area or anywhere across Long Island, if you're having a party, if you're thinking of having a party and you want it to look good. You and if you don't have any place to send New Year's Eve, think about Temple Bonnet Torah <laughs> for, for New Year's Eve. At least they'll have good decorations. They can't vouch for the food. And the food is, it, it might be, um, we're talking to our favorite caterer. Oh, we, yeah. Larry. Larry at Galaxy Caterers. There you go. He was nice enough. He catered something two years ago. He catered at New Year's party. Yeah, that was nice. No, not this year, but uh, two years two ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Our New Year's, what, what do we call it, the New Year's? Well, that one you the suck fest, delightfully called the Craptacular. <laughs> I was under directives from the radio station to keep it, you know, all G-rated and nice, and which we did as best we could until some people drunk called in <laughs> said some things on the air. But but you started the ball rolling by calling, first thing out of your mouth is, here we are at the Craptacular. I'm like, no. No, this is a real party. Do you know that I heard curses on Channel 13? For what show? When? Oh, they dropped the F-bomb. Where? What? On Channel 13. No, what show, dude? I don't know. They're like movies. They just didn't edit it out of it. Okay. They're really not supposed to. I mean, they try and be cool with it. I know I get shocked when I see sometimes on cable. But I'm not talking about HBO kind of cable. Some of those other, like USA and um, Spike where they'll, they'll drop a like word. Like the Playboy Channel. Why are they... <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember as a kid, Channel 13 was trying to be hip and relevant, and the one show that they made an exception for, and that's why we all watched it, was Scare It Straight. You remember that? Yes. Way, way back, early 70s, I think, well, maybe mid-70s, they got these kids who were, shall we say, in danger of being bad kids, they were bad kids. They were recidivist kids. They had. They, they were in danger records. of being criminals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or some of them already were past that danger and well into the criminality stage. So they bring him into prison. You all know this. And and they basically get shouted at by some very very scary people. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't be. T they knew these people weren't going to touch them or hit them, and yet 
it was just scary enough for a bunch of 15 year olds to well, be able to sat down like in groups and talk to them. Yeah. But after the yelling, <laughs> first comes the yelling and the like, you know, screaming the hair off their, their heads. <laughs> and then they're in the mood to sit down and listen. Welcome to life in prison. Yeah. And so the, the one thing, there was disclaimers all over the place. And he said, look, we're trying to present this as a real urban gritty thing to scare your kids straight and to watch how these kids were scared straight. And we're not going to whitewash Especially it. Especially because some of these people were yelling about sexual things they were going to do with them. Oh, wait, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. Huh. You would remember. No. I just remember more about violence, about the threat. Yeah. The imminent daily threat of violence made very clear to these kids in language that was shocking back then to hear on Channel 13. Shocking to me now. The only other real Channel 13 thing where that has come up was when I was interviewing Michael Riedel, who obviously the um, he is the New York Post theater columnist, and he was with us on our Tony show, and he also was with us actually on a previous Tony show as well. So Well, he just phoned in. He actually showed up. He showed up for the Tony show this year, which was really great. He was a wonderful co-host. And I asked him at one point... It was point, known as craptacular, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't great. It was rather marvelous. So... He had said that he never had any problem as far as censorship or difficulty or bleeping with the guests that he and his co-host have on their show Theater Talk on Channel 13 on public TV every week where they interview all these famous theater people, okay. except Elaine Stritch. Stritch, you cannot control Elaine Stritch. She's like Lauren Bacall. She's an old broad, and she'll say what she wants, how she wants, in as colorful language as she can possibly that choose. Merman, that merman. That <laughs> like, merman. Like merman. So, um, he was sure. He didn't know how Channel 13 would approach it. And they just let it go. She, she's stretch. So here she is, Elaine Stritch, cursing up a storm on Channel 13. She's stretchy, actually. Stritchy. Stritchy. So, God bless her. Um, she's the one person who could get away with it on Theater Talk. I guess because she's old. And Cloris Leachman can curse on, on Dancing with the Stars, too. Did she? Oh, yeah. But did they bleep her? Yeah. Well, no, they didn't bleep stretch. That's what I'm saying. But you saw her mouthing words. Good Lord, what was she saying? <laughs> well, she went, yeah. she went, well I, I, can, I can tell you, but not in the colorful language that she right. did, even though it's after 12. Even so. But the, well, the, Carrie Ann and Alba gave her like a five, and she goes, you B-word. Oh, the B-word? That was it? No, she was like hers, and oh, there's more. She's hilarious. I mean, she is playing. You know, she's a very funny lady, Clark yeah, yeah, Christian, yeah. and she knows how to act. And she's like been all over. She's dancing like crap. Oh, and 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 she's getting lowest scores, but the people love her. Well, I read in um, one of these things, it was probably the Long Island Press, where they said, "Look, Cloris, we love you. We we don't want to see you go, but you have to go. You can't." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but she didn't go yet. I know, that's what they're saying. It's like, you've had your thing, we love but you. But this is, it's like the year that Jerry Springer was on it, and he was dancing terribly. And they kept him for at least a yeah. couple of weeks. Too. Well, he kept him for like five, six weeks. Okay, yeah. It's like, and I think he was the one who goes, vote me off already. I don't <laughs> want to be here. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. I think, well, Chorus, I think, had something to prove, though. I mean, when she didn't get well, casting Young Frankenstein. Yeah, she was, uh, she was upset, and... But she had to actually petitioned them for like three or four seasons to get on the, the show. On which? On Dancing? Dancing with the Stars. Oh, wow. I don't even watch this show, but the Cloak Horse Leishman thing is fascinating to me, and I like her. I bless her, and she's in her 80s, and she, again, I don't know if doing that show proves that she could do a Broadway musical eight times a week, but she could probably do it five times a week, you know? Well, it doesn't prove anything. But it's just like, it's just fun to watch her because she's, she's nuts on the show. <laughs> she's absolutely crazy. Good old it's, it's between her and, and the, the moments on the show have been her and then, um, what's the guy from NSYNC? The gay guy from NSYNC? Oh, Lance Bass? Yeah, Lance Bass. He kissed the woman at the, at his partner. Why? Because the song said so. I mean, kissed, like, kissed or on the cheek kissed? Well, they, they did a big, they tried to do it, like, serious. Oh, dear. Kiss on the lips. Which and, lips? No. And everyone, like, laughed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay.
My Amazing Race. They're still having an Amazing Race. It's Amazing Race 12 or 13, I think. Yeah. Where 13 also... races around the world. How great is that? Okay. They won another Emmy, by the way. Oh, wow. They are still the only show since the inception of the Emmy Award for Best Reality Programming to mm. win it. Wow. They're the only show. And they and every year they go, we're not voting for it again. We're not because it's... And, but it's a brilliantly done show. It's just okay. a great show. I have to admit, especially when my back was out, and I had to watch a lot of television because there's not much else I could do. This is a few weeks back. Um, I was watching the uh, the one with Tim Gunn, the, uh, the designer. You, you are either in or you are out. out. <laughs> <laughs> Troy hates when I do that. But every, that's the only other thing Heidi Klum says. It's like, one of you will be out. <laughs> And she's done it four times a freaking show. It's like, I know, I know, know Heidi. We need to change it up a little. Yes, we know. One of them will be awesome. But Tim Gunn, I like I was, okay, people, just make it work. Was he that gay in the first season? I think so. I mean, he just seems much gayer now. He's free to be himself. I guess so. Yeah, now that he's famous, he's got his own show. Which that I haven't seen. I don't have time for that. But I, mean, I do enjoy. I don't know why, but I do. Well, maybe because I enjoy looking at Project lives. Runway. That's Project Runway. That's the one. And also the, the idea that they have to build something, yeah. creating it from an idea. And I, I do find that fascinating. I do like that. Of like, because I have no concept. You can hand me fabric, scissors, a sewing machine, give me fifteen hours, and you would see me. With fabric, scissors, and a sewing machine, <laughs> like just pointing, and probably some stitches in your hand. Yeah, it would be a smock. I Maybe mean, I just wrap it around like a, a little a towel, and we, I'm done. I would have no clue how to cut a so, dress. So, or what a is suit. This, the contestants like? Who do you like as the contestants this season? Have you been watching? Do you, no, I don't care. Oh, oh, oh! I thought we could talk about this. Oh, it's a cable show. That's right. Well, we, everybody hates this one. Woman, she's kind of a southerny girl. Is she? Is she itchy? Ka, her, I think her name is Kali or Ka, Kalu. By the way, if anybody wants to talk about the any of these reality shows, why not give us a call six three one eight 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 one one area code six three one eight 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 one one. If you've been watching uh, Project Runway, if you've been watching The Amazing Race, or Survivor, or, or Survivor, or Big, just the thing, Big Brother too. Big Brother ended. Ah. Big, Brother. Big Brother's a summer show. So 1984 finally ended. All right, that's good. No, they'll be back next year. Oh, so it, this new particular Big Brother ended. Yeah. Okay. They only are in the house for 90 days. It's all they could take in the house. No. Well, I don't know how long. This Project Runway, I guess, only lasts about 12 weeks or however many. No, well, yeah. But, I mean, it's condensed. They, you know, they do the show mm -hmm. every week, but it's probably, they, they probably do... Two weeks of shows in one week, or, oh. or three weeks of shows in one week. So, yeah, that's right. And but the woman, the girl, and I'm, I hope people will back me up on this at six three one eight 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 one one. I think it's Kayla, something like that. She's always nothing's ever either her fault or she's always Does she cry. I like when they cry. Well, they towards the end, like in the later episodes, they're all crying because they're all so scared and they're all so nervous. And all, yeah, but she's just like, it's not, it's not like she's a bitch, but no matter, she cannot take criticism. Oh. And I know what that is because I, I have a hard time taking criticism too. But she's to the umph degree. I mean, any say? suggestion that she's missing something or that this piece doesn't really fit the spirit, she's like, well, of course it does. She has so much <laughs> sense of herself as being right, which right. I guess you have to be in a certain way. But it, it is limiting, and it's annoying. She's pretty obnoxious after a while. And they're all sick of her, and Tim Gunn is sick of her, <laughs> and all the other contestants. Are so why isn't she out? Because she's also clever, and she's got she's in. something. She, but I don't know, I think the black guy's going to win. He seems to have it the most together most of the time. Is he a snap, snap, snap gig black guy? No, he's more of a, I think he's gay, but he's, he's more of a, just together, sort a regular of black normally. gay guy. He's not like Swade. There was one character who called himself Swade and spoke of himself in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> Swade is going to win this challenge, snap. There you go. Swade did, and Swade did, <laughs> oops. So Swade was in for a few weeks, but then, he was a cute, he had a good sense of humor, though. He wasn't so obnoxious as this this woman. Yeah. I think they're just keeping her 
also because she stirs up the mix a little bit. Then there's, she gets to be the bad guy. She's the she villain. She creates conflict. Yeah. Because the other, the other winners in the last thing who are going to New York for the final stuff are one black guy who's very, very good, a black woman who has a real great sense of color, and then there's a, sort of a farm girl, quiet so girl. So you're following this now, huh? I've told, I've told you. I've been watching Project Runway. <laughs> and and just to remind people that uh, I am not gay, there are worse things than looking at Heidi Klum for, for 10 minutes every episode because, you know, she's Heidi Klum for crying out loud. And I like to hear her say, You're one either of, in or you're one out. One of you will be out. <laughs> they walk into a room. Wait, these aren't showers. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, say it your way again. Fun of you. Wouldn't be odd. No. I'll be the same. No, no. I'll be the same. She said that too. I again. know, I know. No, but you, one of you will be out. <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's kind of gloom. <laughs> in, um, in Tim Gunn's Heroes. <laughs> we have, I believe... A caller. So let's put him live on the air. WGBB, Freeport. Dave's gone by. Who's on the phone? David, Pam. Pam, number one fan. Man, don't you have to work tomorrow? Who's it, Pam? Pam from, um, I won't say where, but uh, good for, well, I can say you work in the library. From the library. Yeah. How are you, Pam? It's been such a long time since you called her. I didn't make your um, telethon watching party. Oh yeah, she was she was naughty. She she was invited. We had when I was off um, the Chabad telethon party. You missed that week that I wasn't here, and we played a repeat. Yeah. I was doing a Chabad telethon party, and Pam was invited with her husband, and it was going to be this whole orgy, and we were going to get them both in bed and do great stuff to them, and nothing, nothing. Well, I was Pam. supposed to bring the um, bacon wrapped shrimp. <laughs> That's right for for the yeah, Jewish but I, party. I mean, well, I actually got really sick. I was in. At home for about a week. That's because Dave made you think of him naked. Ew. I don't even want to think of myself naked. The shrimp reminds me maybe of him naked. I don't know. <laughs> Smaller. <laughs> oh, gee, I think we've lost that call. No, no, <laughs> just kidding. So what did you have, mono or, or stereo or something like that? What did you have? Diarrhea. I had just had a really bad cold and fever, and it just came upon me. Like, one night I was just sitting in the living room, and... I felt like you felt like rabbis were dancing in your intestines. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> oh boy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I just felt like my whole body was aching. So Ooh. I actually sent myself into a Nyquil-induced coma. Oh, I love those. Aren't those fun? Cherry flavored or menthol? Cherry. Ugh. Menthol. Yuck. <laughs> my sister and I. Well, she was not in agreement, but I was telling her when we go on the Amazing Race. So I'm planning on uh, submitting oh, an application. Excellent. Not that I'm going to be accepted, but I'm not going to carry those big, giant the knapsack? knapsacks. Or but what, what, do, what do they need that for? That's what the clothes are in. They have to. They have to have bulky clothes because they don't know if they go in the cold climates. There was something that your friend, uh, the black guy, said. Um, is it okay to say black? Yeah. Oh yeah. African American. <laughs> Negro. Um, that, those are about the only three at this point. Okay. All, all the others the black be, man said, uh, you know, he says, I hope, I'm so glad you made it, or something, and he said something like, I'm so glad you didn't make it before. Yeah. I don't know, however he sp spun it, it was... And he just said, yeah, 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 he, he was... Uh, well, Schwarzer. We, 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 we go with uh, Schwarzer. Dave. Yeah. Just sit and listen. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but, uh, and he's, and, and you would talk about me, please. But, um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't like him. I don't know why. Mm, she seems no. like, okay. It just, it but seems like not, for me, I'm like, you, I don't not, I do not dislike him and I don't, I have no opinion. I'm just, not, not because he's black. I wasn't just crazy. because I don't, I don't know, he didn't, uh. Oh, no, course. amazing the level of white guilt in a conversation that has absolutely nothing to do well, I, <laughs> with, uh, with race, of course, it's about a race, but the amazing race. No, it doesn't. Oh, well, no. But we can't, we can't criticize. We can't say, I don't like him, but it's not because, if I promise, but, no. Hey, that's what, know, that's what you caught up on, and I didn't even think about that. Yeah, you I, I just don't. To protect his, uh, no, I said I didn't like the black couple, and you're, then all of a sudden you give him the, the, the. Yeah, all right, I, I did sort of leave you on that. Yeah. Because, no, what happened was I was talking to someone else here today, I won't name names, and they were, on a rant about going on an audition, this young fella 
who was um, trying to be an actor, and he's also on the radio and stuff like that. And he went out for an audition that was incredibly unprofessional. It was for one of these Tyler Perry kind of dumb black movies. Okay. Oh. You know, these comedy things. And oh my it wasn't Tyler Perry, but it was a Tyler Perry wannabe. And he I actually said, saw that movie, Why Did I Ever Get Married? And I thought it was a very good movie. Oh, okay. See? Why are you watching Tyler Perry movies? Well, well one of the actually, my actually funny. requested the DVD, and so she's like, you should watch it. This is really good. Oh. And it really was. Okay. But this was, this was, imagine him without a budget or talent. And these were people who were just so disorganized and, and kind of just okay. bad at what they were doing. So so, no, I'm just saying he went to, to this audition, and he was just shocked at the level of, and so he went on this rather racist rant. It shocked even me. I can't believe we're talking about racism now, and we should be talking about the racism. Amazing racism. <laughs> but but also the the couple that, and then then the, when they raced the the nerds and the the professional football player and his sort right. of ex wife, they mm-hmm. and they got there and they said, oh, they were very happy that they they won the leg, and when you win the leg, you get um all the toes. A, no, you get you get a, <laughs> You, you get, I got it, I got okay, it. Yeah. But you get, I try to ignore these little things. <laughs> oh, okay. What, what, when you, when you win a leg of the race, yes. you also win a prize. And this, this leg, they gave him two. It's lunch for two at the Woodrow. <laughs> at the, um. At the Woodrow Delicatessen. Yum, yum. But, but they won. The, uh... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, but sorry, they sorry. actually won two ATVs. Oh. And they yes. were, they were so excited about it and they, was so happy, and you could say that, and they, they got interviewed. And they said, "Oh, well, mar- it's really helping our marriage to work together." And then the guys who came in just after them said, "And it was so nice. You just wanted to love them." They go, "Well, they if- should have actually been first. They should have, but they didn't. But they weren't because the cab was their cab was slow. The other cab was fast, and they ran yeah. faster. So they, the people coming first always deserve to come first. But but the, the guys turned to them and said. Well, if it helped your marriage improve, the the ATVs are meaningless to us. How Aww. nice is that? Now, see, I, I keep telling my wife I deserve to come first, but she doesn't. <clears throat> she doesn't buy that. But yeah, I guess she doesn't like shrimp. <laughs> and just sometimes she never comes at all. Oh, <laughs> Arnold, are you listening to this? My husband has the radio on in <laughs> his room so that it doesn't interfere, but that he can listen. Okay. But um, right. how long have you been married, Pam? I've been married twenty for minutes, thirteen years. Oh, congratulations! Yay! Oh, it's and your you... black cat anniversary. Is that what it's Is called? What it's... No. What do you, what do you yes, get? Thirteen? Like You're thinking of like Halloween? I don't know. I'm thinking. Of, I'm lucky. Thirteen. Oh well, yeah. You could get a pumpkin or something. For... It's your divorce anniversary. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> oh, that's not going to happen. Good. No, you guys seem. I mean, I, I met your husband once, but you seem really. Suited. They both like to motorcycle and go places. They're very. They Would you like those two ATVs? Uh, maybe. I wouldn't know. Actually, maybe because they're probably very good on gas. Yeah. yeah I could go to the library. <laughs> 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 and then a lot of them got the one where they had. Um, there was this like uh, this. What was it? Pit stop or there was a word that in Spanish sounded like it was the the pit stop, but it wasn't. Pit stopo. I know. <laughs> it's not Spanish. It's Portuguese. I, it's like Portuguese, right? Sorry. Pit, pit stopo. I, think saying, I don't speak Spanish. The two bells, the southern bells. <laughs> I don't speak Spanish. Well, they're, they're not all. They're not one hundred percent there. Yeah. Well, they're southern beauty pageant queens. And I almost said something which would have totally been wrong, but. Almost like Sarah Palin. Ooh, mm-hmm. I love her. What? Oh no! Wasn't she a beauty pageant queen? Yeah, oh. she was actually. I know, but I love her. Oh, I, she's I very cute. She's you know she's not she's not quite in Tina Fey's league, but she's got something. She's got sex appeal. No, I'm just laughing. I'm not kidding. I think they're kind of hot. All right. But I don't like what she represents. Are you going to vote for McCain Palin, um, uh, Pam? Well, it's kind of a secret ballot, so maybe we shouldn't. Pam yeah, it's that. private. That's private. I'm not gonna tell you because you're gonna like har- whatever. I'll tell you. Oh, but you're not gonna tell me because I'm gonna harass you. I think I can guess. <laughs> I think I can guess where your vote's going. You're not going to vote for the black man. 
my, not because he's black. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I, you know, and that's a hard, see, I hate that about that. If you say yeah. something negative about a black person, you have to immediately qualify that it's not because of the fact that they're black. Right. So I don't even... I just, for qualify. some reason, he scares me. Like, I I don't know. I have, but, like, this uneasy feeling. But you know, they came, out, pretty, hmm? they came out last week and they said uh, with um, an actuarial table, and they said it's more likely than not that John McCain will not last eight years. I know. Right. Yeah. Eight, four. We'll have four. No, he, he, he will last four years. In good condition. According to Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. That, that, that. Who leads? He says that that's a tactic, and that the media, the drive-by media, that's what he calls it, the left, <laughs> says that um, it's a tactic so that we will say, oh, well, it's, I shouldn't even go because Obama's winning. Like, I, what's the point? So. What? No. Yeah, yeah no. That's, that's The tactic is to say quite legitimately that there's, I would say, a 50-50 shot or more that sometime within the first four years, if McCain gets elected, He'll be on an operating table for something, and Sarah Palin will be the effective commander-in-chief for at least a few weeks. Would you not grant me that? I mean, the guy's got face cancer, you know, and, and, and things removed from his jaw. And he's 72. Now, he may now live, he may live to 92, but... Yeah, his he, mom is a uh, yeah. feisty... His mother's still alive. That's like really 90. whacked out, huh? Okay, well, it is. But remember Reagan? Reagan lasted his whole eight term. Yeah. I was only eight years, but the last two years he wasn't quite fully President Reagan anymore. He was little little Ronnie again, <laughs> pooping his drawers, and and going to Bitburg, Germany. So, by the time 2012 rolls around, John McCain will be 76, having battled cancer and having been in a prison camp for four years. I mean, I don't think he'll be in the best condition. And then, who's going to step up to the plate but this Twinkie from Alaska? By the way, which is, by the way, an energy-producing state. <laughs> That's right. And, and um, she's cute, and she's a really marvelous communicator. I will give her that. Yes. But we have issues as far as... Um, you didn't, oh, you didn't watch the whole thing. You didn't see no. her, her wink at America like three times. Well, I've seen it on every newspaper. Okay? She's a very cute winker, but, what you know, okay. It's the winker versus the wanker. By the way, we may not answer the questions the way you or the moderator would like. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you, really, what do you see in Palin? Because I kind of like McCain. I just wish he were a Democrat. But what, what do you see in Palin? Estrogen. That's, that's, that's a question for you, Pam. I don't think... Oh, I know, I know. I'm thinking. I don't... Oh, well. Well, that's, that's, that's not something right on there. this show. Well, I'm sorry? We'll have none of that on this show. the same... <laughs> I don't know. I, if I find the same things that, um, like, values-wise... Are you, are you pro-gun? Do you believe in the right I'm truth? not... I, have, I know people who have guns, and I know this is such a crazy answer. I'll tell you why I like her. Honestly, Yeah. because she is a Christian, and I believe in the... I'm a Christian also, and I believe in the same... We have the same beliefs. But Obama is a Christian, too, uh, you know. A serious one. He was, you know, he happens to have that that Muslim middle name, but his dad abandoned him six months in. So Obama's a Christian. Biden's a Christian. McCain's a Christian. I, I feel like for some reason, and it, and it, I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has a lot to do with the news that I listen to, and it seems to be on the conservative side. And I think that. Obama may be... What? I don't even know why I'm having this discussion. Obama is black! He's Hang black. over it! <laughs> don't have the discussion. You're just falling into a pit. I can't. It's because I don't, I'm, so, I'm like... I'm not trying to open a pit here. I'm, I'm, I really want to know... And what newspapers does Sarah Palin read? All of them. Which ones? All of them. <laughs> okay. I didn't hear what you, I, Did you see I, Kay, like, Katie Couric interviews? I hate Katie Couric. Why? What'd I she do to you? She didn't see because I like Sarah, and I feel like she was like. She didn't do anything bad. You watch the interviews. All she asked for was a specific answer to any question. Because what happens? You ask Sarah Palin a question, and she'll answer another question that she wants you to ask her. She'll just say something and go well, and then she'll change the subject. 
But well, and, even, I, and I feel like I'm doing that right now because I don't want to answer these questions. No, no, well, I, I'm not, I'm not, there's no question. <laughs> this is not a question to you. But on, on the interview that I was talking to you about, which was mm-hmm. now, they're walking down. She goes, how do you keep abreast of international scene from Alaska? She goes, well, I read all the, all the media material. And so she, she goes, what, what do, you read? do you read? And she said, oh, all the stuff that's around the office. She goes, what's around the office? Oh, all the papers. Really? All the papers? Name one. So, it was like, real. She said, tell me a specific paper that uh, you want to, you read. And she goes, oh, well, I don't, we don't have to go into detail. Like, what? You just mentioned the Anchorage Daily something. The, yeah. No. I mean, how tough Maybe is that? Maybe the, newspa- the papers, the, the things that she has on her desk have celebrities on the cover. I don't know. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. But I don't want to say no, it's people. Well, they asked to. She could say the New York freaking Times. Well, she... Oh, by the way, Jeff, I, uh, could you please, 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 please... Oh, no, let, let, Pam is our, our phone guest at the moment. Pam, would you like to do our legal ID? Okay, I don't know what to say. What you have do you to do? say, what? does radio yes. stations our name? The call letters oh. and where we're located. Freeport? Wait. Yes. yes. WGBB. What's the number? No. no you don't yeah. even have to say the number. It's just the, the call letters. Letters and town. Right. WGBB, Freeport, New York. Beautiful. Wonderful. Even embellished with that New York part. It was perfect. Thank you, Pam. And we're leaving well, the Freeport, now. Freeport, Caribbean just, Island. It's just... <laughs> 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 I wonder if that would negate the legality of it. I don't, I don't know. If you confuse people, if you say WGBB, Freeport, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> No, because, Freeport, because then it wouldn't be part of the United States. Uh, and it's oh, a, yeah. It's an Freeport, idea. Maine. Something like I that. Freeport, Alaska. Yeah. You're not listening that's to That was my Sarah Palin impression. So, so can I ask why you, you are so uptight and personal about the political? Because it's a Christian thing? Is that the deal? It's private. So a lot of people honestly, don't like to discuss I'm not, it. I'm not in, 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 I'm not informed enough to make a statement because I haven't. Done she the really is not informed because Sarah Palin's a woman, yeah, and because Obama's black. <laughs> oh just can't pull that lever. I, I was really that lever reminds okay, her too you. much. Yeah, his lever's bigger though. <laughs> when I was watching the Republican convention, I was like, I don't know, I don't know. But when I heard her, I just felt comfortable. I'm like, I like her. I just felt she's very likable. Yeah. yeah. I just felt. Well, she's in very my heart. down to earth, and she's I like not. Her. I'm like, like, I really like her. She's a she's lady. Not, she's Sally Field. Hmm. Oh, oh, but I still think Obama should have taken Oprah as vice, his vice presidential. It would have been brilliant. I don't like Oprah either. Right. Not because she's black. <laughs> <laughs> I don't it's like her she's because she's a black think... and a woman. <laughs> oh, Two no. strikes right I there. Think, I don't like her because I think she. Because she's uh, nappy headed. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> See? Oh, don't bring him into it. Well, you are bringing him into it, if that's the reason you're, you're voting for Sarah Palin and, and uh, McCain. Because they're, that, that, I have to do, say that does bother me. If you're using the religion as an actual reason why you're voting for one of these people, that's the reason Bush got in, especially that second time. Because he had all the evangelicals. He had the Christian vote. And that's just killer in this country. And well, look Bush, what they gave us. For, for aren't, eight years. You know, I always think that the, I believe that the evangelical Christians, and, and I, and I feel comfortable because to say make a statement like this because I'm a Christian evangelical Christian, and the nation of Israel, like the Jewish people, we're brothers and sisters. Like we are the same. We are one. Well, Jews are we're, better, it's united. Yeah. Like how? So I don't understand why. Why, why? why do you feel this way? Well, no, I have to. The one thing and and. It, it kills me because as much as I'm, I want the Republicans out of office for the damage they've done the last eight years, and I don't really trust Palin's experience or, or her conservative views on certain things, and and also unfortunately because McCain is is on the Republican ticket, all of that, and yet when they're making fun of Palin for saying over and over again how strongly committed this country should be to Israel, I'm very very torn because I'm very believing in that. I'm for her and McCain on being ultra, ultra pro-Israel. Pro-Israel, yeah. And, and, and here, I, here I see a freaking Biden on TV, who I have to vote for, saying, 
or it may have been actually Obama himself saying, well, you know, we don't necessarily, nobody's questioning the Bush doctrine on how we're dealing with Iran, how we're dealing with Israel. But I don't want them questioning the Bush doctrine. doctrine on Israel. Do you know what the Bush doctrine is? What? Do you know what the Bush Doctrine is? Help Israel no. and, and you know, keep the Middle East. No. What, what, what is it then? The Bush Doctrine. See, this is what no one understands. This is what Sarah Palin didn't know either. See, and also, by the way, that was the first, the first uh, interview with the, the guy from ABC where he asked about the Bush Doctrine. She just, she, rather than saying, I don't know what that is, or, or I'm unfamiliar with that term, what, is, what do you refer to as sure. the Bush Doctrine, she tried to make up the answer. Yeah. You know, okay. and that's unfortunate. See, I don't like that. The Bush Doctrine is what the 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 piece of legislation that they call the Bush Doctrine is when he wanted to go in and invade a country without the approval of the Congress. Because before we mm. go in, you have to. Have you mean Iraq? I, yeah. yeah. Okay. So so before we invaded Iraq, he didn't have congressional approval. And before that, in order to invade another country, or declare war in another country, you had, you had to get to congressional. Yeah. So the Bush Doctrine is okay. Like, Actually, only about that. I should have so. used the word policy, though. Right. What I meant was the Bush policy on Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, and Israel. And so here I am. The guy I'm going to probably vote for is saying, um, "No, we, we we let's re-examine our." Commitment to the Bush philosophy on Israel. No, like, he didn't no, say I'm that. I'm with Palin on that. You know. No, he didn't say that at all. He's a very good friend of Israel. Who is uh, Obama? Biden. Biden. Well, good. That's thank God. I'm assuming thank both candidates. God. Baruch are. Hashem. <laughs> well, no, that's very important to me. That's a very big deal to me. I guess I'm bringing religion into it as well. Well, you know, it's important for the country too because. Because of is Israel's location, it's it's you know just where it is in the middle of all those oil. Okay, move it to Madagascar. Well, then they won't care about it because it's not in the middle of oil producing country. I don't know. Be, have we dug in Madagascar? They probably have good coffee and stuff. I'd like to talk to you about how how did you get involved in? I mean, I know you've been on the air for many years. Uh huh. How did you get involved in this um, radio? Well, thank you. Uh, I, I I you are the number one fan. I have to say. Well, you know, I I studied a bit of radio when I was in college, because back then I wanted to be a jack-of-all-trades, so I was interested in film and television and theater and radio. Any creative endeavor I could just get my hooks into and get my hands on, I wanted to do and try, because I thought I could be creative in all these disciplines. And when you're in college, you can be. You can, you can yeah. try all these things and try and look for jobs in them, which is not quite so easy. So... I did it in college, a little bit of it, and tried to keep my hand in here and there over the years. Like, I was um, the theater critic for WFUV for about two years. FUV is the uh, the Fordham University uh, New station. Jersey College, I forgot the name of it. No, no, it's, it's Fordham in the Bronx. Oh, why was I thinking... Rutgers? What's their radio station? Um, I don't know if we get it too well here. Uh, RHU, oh, maybe? Okay. Or... Um, I'm not sure what the Rutgers station is. No, this is, okay. this is Fordham. It's, Fordham is a very good station musically because it plays folk, pop, rock, Americana kind of stuff. Jeff is stealing my pants. What? Are they still on your body? Is he actually pulling them down as we speak? Wouldn't you like to know? No, it's warm <laughs> in the studio, so I took my pants off and changed them to shorts. And Jeff is oh, moving my so clothing. Oh, you like to work in... Oh, I think he, he wants a more comfy chair, so he's stealing the chair that my clothing were on. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, please, ex I would like to know more of how oh. the Dave's gone by. Yeah, I, I wish it were a more interesting story. So, anyway... Then, no, I, I'm asking you to continue. Oh, well, thank you. So, I was doing theater criticism on FUV and some other pieces for them, and mm -hmm. then I still, I missed, ra I liked doing it. And I was a guest on a couple of radio shows that oh. dealt with theater... So, finally, what, what happened was I was working for a company that I was there as an editor of a website for six years. And sometimes it was really good there and sometimes it was not so good there. And at a certain point, they were developing and designing a radio program about the theater. And I asked to be part of that and to put the shows together and, and they be said, on the of air. Of course not. And they said, no, we need to... <laughs> That's exactly oh, what they said. Of course not. If that was the answer, we, we wouldn't be here right now. 
Probably no. not. No, yeah. probably not. They're, I would have been doing it for them on satellite radio or, or on their own site. So they put. I, I did a, a sample show for them. I did it, and, and no matter what, no matter how I tried to knock through the wall or at least claim some level of loyalty, like, look, I've been working here very hard for you people for five and a half years. I've helped make your website one of the, you know, what it is today. The least you could do is give me a shot, but instead they had different people in mind all along, and they wanted me doing something else, and blah, 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 and they, they put some options. It wasn't in God's way. will. Poor it wasn't David. their will. It was God's will. It wasn't their freaking will. Poor Dave way. didn't fit the mold. Their idea of the mold. I make my own mold. Dave's like Jello. Have you seen my undershirt? Said you have a face for radio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> yeah, I'll remember. Number, you're back to number four fan right now. That's okay. But Pam's up and talking to us at 1.20 in the morning. Well, no, also, I don't think they had a, that I had, I don't think they thought I had the voice for radio. To me, all kinds of voices can be interesting on radio. Howard Stern doesn't have a... You don't have a voice for radio. Well, look at Lynn Samuels for yeah, God's what are, uh, Yeah. Or even look, Rush or any of the people who are interesting radio communicators. They're not the, the pure announcer voice types. They're yeah, all kinds. It's actually annoying. You know, so. the uh, that stereotypical, like, radio guy that, whatever, yeah. and busy. Exactly. There was a pig virus saying that to Howard Stern. Right. And like Howard Stern yeah, was like, no, I don't have to sound like that. I don't you know what's amazing that. that I think something and you know what I'm thinking, which is awesome. And how you helped me go through my whole train of thought, how we got through the whole your wife's story. I don't want to say her name. Do you ever say her name over the radio? Joyce, yeah. Not her last okay, name. I didn't want to. Yeah. Let's say her last name. Backwards. Liu. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say backwards. I don't even remember her last name. Okay. Well, we don't, we don't need to. Um, no, no, okay. Because she's so, on the uh, run from the feds and it's, it's a, a whole big story. So, it's like how you follow how my mind works is awesome. It's well, yeah, because so. secretly I'm trying to convert you to Judaism. It's a slow process, mm -hmm. but I'll get you there. I promise. So, the... Uh, so <laughs> I Notice wanted... a distinct laugh, the lack of laughter Thank there. You. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I chuckled or something. I she know. chuckled. I, what am I going to say to that? Like, what can I say? Screw you! <laughs> <laughs> or are you no. wearing your red Kabbalah string? No, I... <laughs> Or is that just a okay. tampon? But yeah. Cabal, is it? Okay. Oh, see, I don't want to get into this conversation. Oh, finished. do you know what happened today? What happened today, Jeff? Did you, I, I heard on the radio it was a sad day in, in the New York, New York metropolitan area. Hmm. When I talk like... Wait. I can't... I have to... If I say the words... Well, I'll tell you what was sad. I, I forgot to bring the CD, but one of the founding members of the Kingston Trio died. He died uh, yesterday no. or the day before. That wasn't... It was there. You know but the well... Oh, the, yes, yes, the last, the Lit. very first Carvel store is going to be closing in, in New this York. This week. Yeah, where was it? In New Jersey. Oh, well, it's not New York, so who cares? <laughs> Hear that commercial. You let me the man, Pam. And that's the yeah. one with the retarded I child thing. Oh, I love that. I but, no, Pam, Pam did something sort of wonderful. They're sort differently of abled, not retarded. She went into You Let Minute Man Press and asked for a 10%. Well, no, no, she said, hey, I heard you guys on the radio. It was fabulous. She said, I heard you guys on Dave's Gone By. I think it's great that you're supporting him. You know, it's a wonderful show. Thanks for sponsoring him. She didn't buy anything. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you just you know, went I knew the... you were going to say that. I knew the last time you said that story, you told you said the same thing, that I didn't buy anything. Well, you should go make a copy. One copy. Spend the dime. Get one penny would back. That, would that kill you? So are you going to go to the Woodrow and have something to eat? No, I'm going to go to Woodrow. Oh, can we go together as a field trip? Sure. And, like, record it and then air it? I don't know. Oh, actually, that might be fun, except then they would know that you're kind of more than a listener to the show. You're a fan of the show and a friend of me. So, therefore, you're not the show we want you to be. Yeah. There. Whereas if you go alone or with Arnold or with friends. If and we can ever make a date. Or the next time we have a date, we'll have it at the Woodrow. There you go. There you go. Or if you ever have, want to have a date with me, when Arnold's not looking, you know, I'm, 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 you know, my wife's away three days. And ago. Dave's straight, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds gay, yeah. but he's straight. And I haven't dated you a Christian girl. can actually do that. What, sorry? Because, like I said, we have crazy schedules. Yeah. But One I, night after the movie at the at the library. Yeah, like nine, ten thirty, ten o'clock. You know, go out, grab a. No, they're closed actually. They're, they're usually open until about nine, so it would have to be on a non-movie night. But they're open for dinner every night. The Witchrow. And maybe you could have your next party there. 
I'll have lunch there. Not tomorrow. You know they have a, you know they have a full catering room. This is true. Full catering and for private parties. They can take the room and, and just block it right out. You could even have a communion there if you want. I guess. They'll spit in you. They'll pee in the pig. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Uh, oh. Okay. We don't do communion. We're That's Catholic. Oh. So you're a prot? I'm a prot. <laughs> okay. She's born again. So I don't know. I thought Catholics could be. I, I don't know any of this stuff. So you don't believe in the Pope? No, they believe in him. Believe in God. Not a person like the Pope. Okay. I, I heard a joke, and it was something. I'm not. I'm going to ruin it, whatever. Joke? But I'll just tell you the gist of the story okay. of the how something where like God, uh, God, see, oh no, the Pope was saying something. If it's God's will, they'll live, and the whole thing. But as he drove away in his bulletproof Pope mobile. Oh yes, that was on. That was. What uh, was that? They they said that um, it was on the late night talk show. Okay. And it, it was so, it talking about gun control and. Was it gun control? Or well, the Pope was, uh, you know. <laughs> this is some uh, joke. It was, well, I it's don't not know. even a joke, but it's. I but guess it not. Uh, Jeff knows what I'm talking it was, about. Yeah, it was all about the fact that the Pope thinks whatever happens, happens, and the, if people die, they die. The Pope and, is sounding very Jewish at the moment. Whatever happens, it happens. If they die, they die. God's here. He's not. He's whatever. You do, do, do what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, but, but, uh, and then he, Go, make some money. Gets, support goes, your family. He goes into his bulletproof public meaning he doesn't want it to happen what's going to actually right. happen. Like, it could, it's okay if you die. Oh, I... God's will if you die, but I'm going to do everything I can to prevent it from happening. <laughs> Something like that. So that was fun. But, um... Well, what, was that from... Where was that, that? I don't know if it was from Airplane... Or something like that, where the guy is in the airplane and he's he's, he's not a pilot and he has to bring the plane down or else crash or whatever. Yes, and someone's right. trying to. Is it, I think it's airplane, or it may just be a joke what? where the the um, there's someone at the ground and the control tower trying to tell this person. Arnold would know this because he knows that movie word for word. Okay, so so the control tower guy is trying to um, talk him down to this person who's never flown a plane before. And and the plane guy is, is like panicking, saying, "We're gonna die! We're gonna die!" And the control room guy is like, "No, that is not true." Well, I'm not. Going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because Arnold and I made a reference to that movie today. Uh, but I'm not sure where. if it was from there or from from another place or from just a joke book or forget where I heard it. But I just burst out laughing when I read it. I that. don't know why that makes. Uh, why? What? Something else popped in my head, that, that the singer telegram lady, you know, know that little joke? Tell. She, the, the guy comes to the door and says, like, telegram. Thank God this is a 1-800, oh, no, it's not a 1-800 number. Yeah, no, it's, it's not. a local Hang call. Up. It's a local call. You're, it's all free. Well, well, actually, well, the Suffolk is local, ain't it? Yeah. Okay. Right, I have unlimited whatever. Yeah. This, it's not, we're, and it's an overnight. Just, and we're like, nationwide. Well, this is a 1-800 number. This is how my mind works. Oh, because it sounds like one, because we got the 888 in there, but it's not. It's a local call. And anyway. So thank you. And it's routed through Beijing because of the station. Oh. So, so it, yeah, you might wind up Let's being charged Jeff about $3 a minute. Sorry. What? What? Sorry? Let's let Jeff tell his Oh, sorry. No. Jeff, your joke. This woman gets a... And I'm the door. one who interrupted, and then I said, let's let him get back to his joke. There you go. So she opens let, the door. Let's, let's now do a drum roll for Jeff's joke. Go. We got it. <laughs> so a woman opens the door. This guy says, "I have a telegram for um, for Sylvia," and she goes, "Oh, I've always wanted a singing telegram. I'm so glad it's not a singing telegram." Because she goes, "Oh, all my life I've been waiting for a singing telegram. Can you please, please?" Give it? She goes, "It's not a singing telegram, but I really, really want it." She goes on and on. She goes, "Okay, fine." Your sister Rose is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that joke, and it still works. <laughs> it's good. That was a good one. Yay. Woo. I don't have noisemakers or anything. Or it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's such an old classic it's joke. It's brilliant. That's a it's wonderful cute. joke. It was good. It was a good one. Well, I'm who? not in a mess. Personally, I, oh my, my life God. is very good, and I don't know where. Oh my God! I don't even know what's going. On. I don't even see a recession. Where? What recession? Oh my God! Well, yeah, you're, you're talking to a man who did not do very well in the stock market this week. 
or the past couple of months, yeah. especially this week. Not me. The last two weeks have been painful for me. So you don't. I'm I sure assume Pam. We all have. Like if I look and Ar I say I don't really look at that stuff that Arnold does, and your retirement <laughs> fund is dead. <laughs> no kidding. Well, your your you four hundred one k and all that stuff is going to be way down yeah. right now. It's I'm not ready to cash it in. I have yeah, I know, but there are a lot of people. Years. There are a lot of people over fifty, who yes. uh, one of my friends told me he was the, uh, he he works in his accountant, and all these people the first time the Congress voted down the, this uh, bailout package, mm -hmm. that they all like you just heard it on the, you know they heard it on the news and all of a sudden you heard this moan in the office and it was like oh how many more years do I have to work, you know because it really killed the retirement. And how about all the people who are retired and living off of these things? Well, that too. And I mean, you're lucky, Pam. You have a decent, steady job at the library, where you know, kiss kiss her shoes and and, and kiss the the shoes Republican of Republican politicians who give you the job. Well, it'd be Democrats now. Swazi's, um No, but but you're in. You're still in. Um, well, you're still in. in you're in the town of Hempstead, aren't you? Do you know it? Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, whatever. Well, no, you're, you're asking <laughs> why, who it, who it affects, and it isn't affecting you yet. You don't feel it yet. You were feeling it more probably when you had to gas up your your SUV, mm -hmm. to you know a month ago when I gas. I drive a 1994 Toyota Camry. So how's the the mileage on that? She has good mileage. Camry's good mileage. Yeah, but after I have ten years, it, it kind of get better mileage. No. Toyota is a wonderful car. Yes. Let's get free Toyotas. Let's get them as a sponsor. That'd be nice, yeah. Yeah. I'd like a Prius, please. I would, too. You've been watching too much Larry David. Oh, my God. Larry David sold his Prius to whatever the his agent is. What's his name? I don't remember. To Jeff Garland? You mean the guy on the show? Yes, Jeff. For $3,000. I mean, I know it's a show. It's not real. It's oh, all. He's like, yeah. oh, give me 3000 for it. I don't even know how much it's worth. Do you know... <gasps> On the prices right this week, they gave away a Prius, and they actually said they were like making jokes in the middle in the, in the showcase, yeah. and it yeah. says, you know, this is all the ways. It's, it was I forgot what the thing is, and he goes, if you and if you want to really be better than everybody else, you can get this brand new car. It's a Prius <laughs> where you can drive the road and tell everyone you're better than they are. <laughs> they had Drew Carey. Like, uh, had Drew Carey like, on the floor laughing. Aren't you glad that Drew? Carrie is like the host. Like mm, I'm I'm mixed because as you, you know, everything I like, everything I like. I didn't say I like. hate it. I have mixed opinions about that. Mm. The show is about the contestants, and it tends he tends to take away the focus a lot. I like him. I he's a very likable person, <laughs> you know. And and but but remember, I you, Jeff, you just don't like him because he's black. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is, the contestants can hug him. Uh, they were afraid to hug Bob No. Oh, no, they were not. They were not. No, they weren't. They were instructed. I believe that they were instructed that they couldn't. That is absolutely not true. That is 100% not true. What? Because what you forgot, Pam, is I was a former contestant on the Price Is Right. dot com website, and you read that. No. I was on the Price Is Right. It says, don't touch Bob. There's a thing that says. Can I YouTube it and I'll find it? Uh, I, well, no, actually, oh, they took it down off YouTube. Why? Uh, because CBS, it was, it was copyright infringement. But did you, put, you didn't put it up on YouTube. I didn't put it up there. Yeah. Yeah. Post something on YouTube and they took it off. It was yeah. a um, reference to Fallout Boy and the whole Sim Simpsons. Where, that scene where the, um, not Fallout Boy, but who was the nuclear man or some guy, whatever, he had these goggles on and, the acid was, he was like floating in a stream of acid and he was like, these, my eyes, these goggles don't do nothing. Do you remember that? No. no. What? Okay. But anyway, just so you know. Was, was, was it Duff Man? Man? Huh? When, was Duff Man? Duff Man is a beer. Yeah, but he always wears all his goggles and he's like, Duff Man! No. I'll, I'll see if I can, well I can't send it to you on YouTube because we posted it. But just so you know, there oh, yeah, was, well, there was no, pen? there was no reason for the, the, I, I hugged Bob Barker in the last one of his last shows. I can't believe you won the Price is Right. Did you win? What did you get? Yes, I did. <gasps> what? Yeah, he, he really, he won some great stuff, actually. Yeah. Not, not a joke. I won an 
forty-six dollar hammock. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, the hammock, right? The hammock's great. It's in my friend's backyard. It's huge. Okay. You could fit like six people on this hammock. It's really big. It, it was a. It has every accessory you'd ever want on a hammock. It has a what, TV what stand. Are hammock accessories? What? <laughs> what is what? a hammock accessory? Uh, it has a cover, you know, for shade. It has a drink holder. It has a TV stand, you know, table, TV table. It has, um... Does it come with turtle wax? No. Oh, damn. <laughs> Lifetime supplies. But it has all these little bells and whistles, which is very interesting. Right. And then I got so what my... What did you give it away as a gift? Yeah, I gave it to my best, one of my best friends. Oh, oh sure, don't give it to old Dave. Would you be yeah, sitting in the backyard on a nothing. hammock? I'd be sitting on the backyard on a hammock. Now. That's why I gave it away, because I'm not going to be in the hammock either. All uh, right, well... Okay, I'm so what else did you get? It. Okay. Oh, and then no, I, but he won some really good. Then I got up on stage and I played squeeze play, and I, I played squeeze play. Oh, and you're squeezing oh, Bob a number out of the thing, and then you can uh huh, you pull, like remove one of the digits out of the money. What would it was it a car that you were? I pulled the five out, and I got a sixty-five inch color TV. Woo! Do you, do you yeah. still have it? Mm-hmm. So any burglars who are, are thinking of uh, coming right. to <laughs> while he's at the station. <laughs> It's just this giant TV in his living room. That's right. Oh, my God. And, and his roof isn't quite fixed, so it's pretty easy to get out yeah. and lift it. But, no, he, yeah, he won this really enormous screen TV. It's it's like the biggest. It's bigger That's than... some money, too. You won a couple of Well, times. I won that later because they invited me to come back to be part of the Bob Barker replacement search. And so... He wasn't... You weren't trying out. You were, yeah. I want to be on a talk on a game show. How do I go about this? I, what else did I, I want to do? I want to be on the Amazing Race. Well, well the Amazing to... Race, you have to fill out an application. Okay, I'll do. I'm, I, I, I'm not going to be able to run in the hot 1,000 degree, 100% one well, here. Well, you have to. Well, they always put you through a desert. Hmm. Around like six <sighs> or seven, you'll see they go through a desert. I want to go on like a game show, like a local game show. It's not so, you know, it's not like, I have to, well, if they, do they pay for you to go to California? Like the Price is Right? No. The Price is Right is a very different it. is a very different show. You go to California and you just get a ticket and you stand in line. Oh, yes, you're in the audience. And you have no idea you're a contestant until you're a contestant. So when they say, come on down, that's why everybody I looks really had, shocked. Yeah. yeah. You're you wearing a tube top and when, was that you? Yeah. You were wearing My a tube top out, and as yeah. you ran down, your tube top fell down. That's exactly who I am. Wow. That was you? No wonder yeah. they took that off YouTube, yeah. <laughs> but they people like me because I, I actually I had people sign my shirt. Oh. You saw it, Dave, didn't you? Yeah, yes, I saw it a couple of times, I know. I think I still have it on a video cassette. Dave somewhere. even saw my special episode of The Price is Right, a woman oh. called Lasagna. Oh. It, 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 was, it had nothing to do with Jeff, but there was some... Um, it was, was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, Price is right, and there was a, oh, oh, you know what color the woman was? <laughs> a black woman whose name was spelled L-A-S-O-N-Y-A. Lasagna. Lasagna. But Bob Barker, really probably not as a joke or not for any other reason, just from the way he would pronounce that word, kept calling her lasagna. <laughs> oh, that's why it's a lasagna episode. Yes. And she never corrected him. She got up on stage and, hi, lasagna, how are you? And the, the concept of this, this middle-aged black woman we can call lasagna <laughs> was rather amusing. That's fun. Maybe one day I'll get to watch it. I'm... It was quite I'm interesting. Kid. 201 in the morning here. Hey, I hope Pam's still good, alive. hope Arnold hasn't beat well, her. Well, I, I think maybe... maybe. Oh, she is oh, calling okay. back. <laughs> let's, get, let's get her back then. WGBB, Pam? Your sister, Rose. Arnold is freaking out because I said his last name over there. Well, I didn't even hear it. Oh, did he hang up? Name. Was that it? No, it, I don't know what. I thought you guys hung up on me. No, no, we just lost you. We figured that you, you freaked out at saying your name and mm -hmm. just kind of... No. <laughs> Can we play some, like, sexual music? Look, we still have all the, all the um, gossip hey, music. I want to be out of here by 2.30. 2.30. I'm, 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 no matter what, I'm turning, I'm, I'm out of here by 2.30. Can we play se some gos sexually explicit gospel? There's no such thing as sexually explicit, not in these racks. I mean, there could be, but it ain't gonna be here. Damn it, Jesus. <laughs> Give it to me, Jesus. Pam got it. What's wrong? <laughs> ooh, ooh, drive again, drive it. That ain't no nail. Yeah. <laughs> 
Chicago and Waggy. Now Pam's now they're fighting for who can turn off the radio first. That's it. <laughs> oh. This program was brought to you by Woodrow Delicatessen in Peninsula Boulevard, uh, Peninsula Shopping Center. They're actually on Peninsula Boulevard. Peninsula. It's like penis. <laughs> and which thing? I pickles. Get... Yeah. <laughs> We're getting silly ladies. Pete and the pickles. Fancy Schmancy Balloons. Five, you know, we never give out the phone number for Fancy Schmancy. What is it? It's okay. No one ever calls me. But I'll uh, give it out anyway. I have, I've, I've had the worst business in forever. Five one six seven nine seven three two two nine. You can buy your, the furniture for all your party decorating needs. Seven nine seven three two two nine. Fancy schmancy balloons. Hewlett Minuteman Press, the copy kings of Broadway. Ten percent off for all Dave's gone. Just walk in and say you listen to him on the radio, just like Pam. Right. And maybe you'll get lucky tonight too. Ten percent off at Hewlett Minuteman Press. 1315 Broadway in Hewlett. And they're open six days a week for all your copying and printing jobs. <laughs> and Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine, the Bible of Broadway for more than 65 years. Performing Arts Insider. Go to performingartsinsider.com to find out more. And, and also to davesgoneby.org to find out how you can get a one-year subscription to PAI for only a hundred and twenty dollars. That's oh? like fifty bucks, sixty bucks off. When are you going to make it a hundred and nothing? Like ninety nine, ninety nine. Not for no. We haven't done that in a long, long time. Can't I, do it. it. It's not worth it. it it's we've got to charge. It's a journal, and people pay a lot for it because of the information that Performing Arts Insider has in it. This program. I want it for free. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Carol Edmonston. What's Thank you, sir. At SidHoff.com, S-Y-D-H-O-F-F dot com. Put on that last F for funny. There you go. The extra extra no, funny. An extra F. And who was the O? Oh, and, and David Sheward, executive editor of Backstage. I want to thank him so much. It's for, like we only talked to him like three hours ago. ago. It's like, it feels like days ago, doesn't it? No. Hey, Mom and Dad. Love who you, Mom and Dad. about mm, 40 years ago? Yeah. 44 or 45, to be exact. And love I was seeing them at uh, Rosh Hashanah, and I'll see you guys on Yom Kippur. Night How was Rosh Hashanah dinner? What'd you have? You have a little tegelach? What's tegelach? What is tegelach? Is it a matzo ball? No, no, we had the usual. It was turkey and also a roast and potatoes and my grandma's special recipe, purple glop, which is purple. cranberry with a little pineapple and some other Ooh, stuff. That's pretty good. Yeah. Sounds good. Did you save me any? Uh, no. Sorry. Well, there wasn't that much left over. <gasps> there wasn't. You didn't invite me either. Well, I thought you were out of town. Sorry. Next year, I won't you invite you You knew I wasn't out of town because it was Monday night. We did the radio show the Sunday night before it. Yeah, well, I don't know what you're... Well, anyway, I, I, it's not my business to invite you to my parents' party. I want to be invited. Well, I'll ask. I'll ask um, about an upcoming whatever. Okay. Circus. <laughs> you can sit on the roof. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Can we? Can we go? Can we no. Please go. It's my show. How did I lose control of my show? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You invited me about a year and a half ago. Well, we're gonna play one more time. My my brand new song, the song for the economy. Crappy days are here again. But uh, before then, it's just want to say it's time to leave the neighborhood. But I will be back, and I hope I Jeff will be back. And too. you know why? why? Happy days are here again because we're not on the air for another week. That's right. For six days, you're going to have to go without Dave's gone by, without me and Jeff, and the big time. Although you can hear um, Filler Up on this station where I play music for half an hour. Um, I forget it's two nights a week here. Jeff Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, no, I think Saturday nights and maybe Tuesdays. Go check am1240wgbb.com to find out when you can hear Filler Up with me, Dave, on this radio station. And but, yeah, without me, Jeff. Without Jeff. But Jeff will be back. I'll be back next Sunday, October 12th, with the 294th episode of Dave's Gone By. So until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz. And Jeff Goodman. Wishing you a good night. An easy fast and gone by. Banks are failing fast.
beds are bathing, look at all the falling stock. War, inflation, dying nation, smashing upon Plymouth Rock. Crappy days are here again, the world is filled with fear again, our savings disappear again, crappy days are here again. Grab your money from the bank, and hawk your clothes to fill your tank. We have George Bush and Greed to thank, crappy days are here again. My, how the deficit's grown, and good luck getting a loan. See the banks go up in smoke, and all the brokers going broke. Just like the New York Mets, they choke. Crappy days are here again. Everybody's lost and dumb, and frightened of the years to come. But there are no towers to leap from, crappy days are here again. One thing we all know for certain, no one's hurting at Halliburton. Crappy days will hit us hard, keep maxing out that credit card, while other countries we bombard, crappy days are here again. Everyone is sad and stressed, depression leaves us all depressed, America's been repossessed, crappy days are here again.